does that. Recording in okay. progress. Hi, everybody. We've got our participants coming in. So here we go. I'm going to get us ready to go on uh, Facebook so that our um, online everybody can come hang out with us as well. Um, and I hope everyone is enjoying this. Uh, Dr. Jen, Dr. Horn, Dr. Jen, Dr. Jen, would you like to talk about what you just dropped in the chat? Sure. Um, one of our traditions with Shakesology, we have been doing this for close to a decade now, usually in the basement of the, the Knox County Public Library at Lawson McGee. Um, but I always hand out a devilishly tricky set of 10 questions where um, this is one where if you get one right, be proud of yourself. That's how hard these are. But the good side is even if you get none of them right, by the end of this, you will be able to dazzle your friends with your random trivia knowledge of the play. And so like you can take notes on it and we've put it as a Google Doc. So by all means, download, download it, write things in. And um, yeah, just amaze people with your, I don't know, Shakespearean nerdiness. That's totally what I call it for myself. Um, but we have some some very difficult questions and maybe one or two that aren't quite so evil, but they are pretty good trivia. So feel free to take a look at that, see if you can get any of those answers. Um, for most of these, we're going to try to, to have you answer these in the chat when we get to that point in, in the presentation. And um, I look forward to seeing how you guys do on it. Yes, I do too. I also look forward to seeing how I do on it because if we're all going to be 100% quite frank, my job here today is to hang out with our, um, is to hang out with the uh, audience members and to, you know, check the chat and to help Jen keep track of everyone who's asking questions and things like that. And as um, an actor in the show uh, this time around, and someone who loves Shakespeare and loves all of these things that we do, um, there are also a bajillion, if not, you know, I would say like 80% of the things that Jen talks about are these things and I'm learning new things. So I am here with you learning. Don't feel bad. The title next to my name says Associate Artistic Director. And I think that's just so that keep me around. Uh, it is not because I'm the smartest person in the room. So do uh. not feel, don't feel bad about that. And I will say I put in a ton of research for these each year, and there are lots of these things that I didn't know before I started researching the play. So keep that in mind. Even I, I have a PhD in Shakespeare studies, and I didn't know some of this stuff either. So that's why I, I tend to only put the really dazzle your friends and amaze them type of, type of trivia or make your friends really worry about you type of trivia. And while we're while we're waiting to get started, I will say one of my favorite bits of 12 night trivia is um, or ephemera the Globe Theater, if you order um, things from their shop, this was their Christmas gift wrap paper one year um, with the yellow stockings cross gartered and it makes me happy. So I felt the need to share. All right. Well, we are uh, we're all ready to go. Our Facebook fam is here with us. Our YouTube fam is here with us over here. Um, if at any point I turn my camera on and you're seeing me look in a random strange direction, uh, it's because I'm trying to make sure that I catch where everyone is saying and what everyone needs. Uh, so without much further ado, um, I'll take a moment to introduce. So this over here with us is Dr. Jennifer Horn. Dr. Jennifer Horn is Tennessee Stage Company's resident dramaturg. Uh, and she is also the, um, the chair of our Education and Outreach Committee. Um, as a 501c3 nonprofit, Tennessee Stage works every year as part of our mission statement to provide a free and affordable um, theater and education to the people around us uh, and also provide working opportunities for professionals in East Tennessee. Um, one of those professionals is Dr. Horn right over here. Uh, so I'm so excited to have all of you with us. Um, uh, thanks for joining our free event. Uh, the show is about the show. I'm so used to doing that. The event is about two and a half hours long. So right around 5.30 we'll be done. But if for any reason, you know, you need to go take a break, 
Uh, you need to go use the restroom. You need to go get a glass of wine, whatever it is that makes it entertaining. Uh, for those of us who joined our um, Shakespeare, a drunken Shakespeare, I promised our drunken Shakespeare folk that I would have a drink. So I have a cocktail, it matches my outfit. Um, this is St. Olivia, which is named after the character that I'm playing in the show that we're talking about today. Um, so I do have my, I do have my cocktail um, to keep the promise that I made to our patrons. Um, but we'll get started. If you do uh, have to take a break, this will be up on Facebook for about a week and then we'll, uh, for two weeks, then we'll take it down and the next one for the Tempest will be up uh, at the end of the month, uh, two Saturdays from now. Uh, but if you go to our webpage, TennesseeStage.com, or you follow the registration link, this will be up for forever. You can go and watch this at any moment in time. If you uh, come to see the show when the show opens in July and you want to check back and re-watch and relearn to get acclimated to the show, you can absolutely come back and watch this anytime for free. Uh, just re-register for the event and it will send you a link right to this recording. Um, so without more ado, I'm gonna turn my camera off and I'm gonna let uh, Jen take the take the lead. Um, so with, go, go for it, Dr. Horn. Okay, and again, feel free to follow along with the trivia challenge. These are gonna be in the order that, we'll, that I'll be talking about them in the presentation. And I, I'm curious to see how you guys do. So when we get to those points, please put them in the chats for Zoom in the comments for Facebook. Um, and, and I look forward to seeing if you meet the challenge. And the good thing is, even if you don't get a single one right by the end, you will know all that you are like to know to borrow from the Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, Shakespeare nerd, if you couldn't tell from the shelf behind me. So today we are here to talk about Twelfth Night. So let me share my screen. Oh, Caitlin, I'm having problems sharing my screen, if you can help me out with that. So while she's doing that, um, I will tell you this, the format of of the rest of this which is that um i'm going to be talking for about an hour and a half give or take about the history of the play about shakespeare sources about the production history which is my personal um favorite part and then we are going to transition over to the current production which is actually in rehearsal as we speak they let caitlin out a little bit early today but we are going to be talking with the director and hopefully see some more of the cast members if not we have caitlin representing and so um we have that at the end of of the presentation so now we've got Twelfth Night Shakesology, and yes, I had to start with the yellow cross gartering. So for all of you who, who are giving up part of a lovely Saturday afternoon for Shakespeare, um, I am assuming that some of you know a lot about this play, but other of you, others of you might be new to this. So I wanted to really quickly go over the plot of Twelfth Night. So yes, for the entire time of Shakesology, there will be spoilers. So as Caitlin mentioned, if you wanna see the play first, feel free to come back and, and watch this later on or rewatch it later on, but just know spoilers everywhere for a more than 400 year old play, sorry. So the quick version of the plot synopsis, and this is taken from a Royal Shakespeare Company program from 1997. The boy loves the girl, but thinks he might also love a boy. But the girl loves another boy who's really a girl, and this girl loves the boy. Confused? They are too. So in other words, this play is not straightforward. It twists and it turns, and there is craziness throughout. I was trying to find a quick and easy plot synopsis. I don't think one exists. The fastest one that I have found is from the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. So if you can deal with me for a minute, especially if you know the play well, just know that some people might not. And so I want to quickly go over this plot synopsis This is detailed enough because I wanna make sure that you know who these characters at the bottom are as well as who the major characters are. So feel free to follow along with the figures on your screen. 
this again, this is the plot synopsis from Shakespeare's Birthplace Trust. Orsino, Duke of Illyria, is despairing that he is spurned by the Countess Olivia. She has forsworn men's company for seven years while she mourns the death of her brother and her father and rebuffs all of Orsino's advances. Nearby, a group of sailors arrive on a shore with a, a teenage girl, Viola, whom they have rescued from a storm at sea, Viola laments the loss of her twin brother, Sebastian, in the shipwreck. She resolves to fend for herself by dressing as a boy, as you do, to get work as a page to Duke Orsino. Despite his former rejection, Orsino sends his new page, Cesario, Viola in disguise, to court Olivia for him. Cesario, Viola, whatever you want to call her, fell in love at first sight with her master, Orsino, and so she goes to court Olivia unwillingly. To make matters more complicated, Olivia continues to reject Orsino, but is attracted to Cesario. She sends her proud Stuart Malvolio after him with a ring. Thus, a genuine love triangle arises between Olivia, Viola Cesario, and Orsino. Meanwhile, members of Olivia's household plot to expose the self-love and aspirations of the Stuart Malvolio. These include Olivia's uncle, Sir Toby Belch, her servant, Mariah, and Sir Toby's friend, Sir Andrew A.U. Cheek. Sir Andrew, by the way, his name is as good as Sir Toby Belch because AU is sick, so Sir Sick Cheek. Um, Sir Andrew also happens to be seeking the hand of Olivia. Together, they use a letter to trick Malvolio into believing Olivia loves him. The letter demands that Malvolio appear in one, yellow stockings, two, cross gartered, and three, and the worst, smiling to show his love for Olivia. After he does so, the Countess is horrified and has Malvolio shut up in the darkness as a madman. Meanwhile, Viola's twin brother Sebastian has also survived the shipwreck. He comes to Illyria with his sea captain friend Antonio, who was a wanted man for former piracy against Orsino. Sir Andrew's affections for Olivia lead him to be jealous of Cesario, and he decides to declare a duel between them. Thanks to a prank by Sir Toby, both Andrew and Cesario believe that their opponents intend to fight to the death. They both shirk the fight, totally run away. However, the sea captain Antonio passes by and mistakes Cesario for Sebastian and intervenes to defend his friend. He is recognized by Orsino's men and arrested. Later, Sebastian comes along and is challenged by Sir Andrew, who he thinks is Cesario, or who thinks he is Cesario. Sebastian, trained in combat, wins the fight. But Olivia intervenes and invites Sebastian into the house, also thinking him to be Cesario, and they are married that very night. Malvolio, held in a dungeon for being a madman, is psychologically tortured by Mar Mariah, Sir Toby, and Festy, the court fool. Festy dresses up as a pirate to convince Malvolio that he is in fact mad. After realizing that they might get in trouble for treating Malvolio this way, they allow him a pen and a paper to be able to write a letter to Olivia. Antonio is brought to talk with Orsino, and upon seeing Cesario, he accuses him of betrayal. Just then, and the real Sebastian arrives to apologize for fighting Sir Toby. The twins see each other and discover that they are both alive. Orsino's full Festi brings a letter from Valvolio, and on his release, Mariah's letters are revealed to be fraudulent. Malvolio departs, promising revenge. Mariah and Sir Toby have already married in celebration of the success of their plot against the steward. The play ends as Orsino approves the union uh, between Olivia and Sebastian, realizing his own attraction to Cesario, quote unquote. Orsino promises that once Viola is dressed as a woman again, they will be married as well. I'm exhausted. Are you exhausted? A lot happens in this play. I'm sorry I took up so much time with that, but I want to make sure that you know a little bit about who characters like Antonio and Mariah are because we won't be talking about them as much for, for a while. So that is the story. Nice and easy, right? So we get to question number one on your trivia challenge sheet. Where is, is Illyria located? I'm sorry, I've already given this away, but if you got this right, 
feel free to pat yourself on the back. I will say before I started studying the play, I didn't think it was a real place. I thought it was made up. I have since learned that this is part of the ancient world across the Adriatic Sea from, from Italy. So we've got Italy here and Illyria. This was a place of rugged seacoasts where you have lots of pirates and problems with boats. So shipwrecks were not uncommon. Um, so that's the type of atmosphere that Shakespeare is evoking here. And this is the Balkan coast you see on the modern map. This is modern Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, Montenegro, and the upper part of Albania. So that is where this action is taking place. And as you see historical productions, you will see a lot of um, what they at least thought were um, traditional types of clothing from that region. So just know that that all goes along together. And what I didn't include in this is the other place name that we get, which is Messaline, which is where Viola and Sebastian come from, where their father had been Duke in that place. And here's the thing, this one, there is not a clear answer of where Messaline is because there, there are a number of contenders, including um, Messina, where um, Much Ado About Nothing takes place, Mytilene from, from Greece. Um, we also have Manzolino from Italy. And the place that probably convinces me most, and it doesn't sound like it at first glance, but um, Marseille, the port city in France, because the Latin version of that is Messilia. And actually, in one of Shakespeare's sources, there is a line about Istrians, Spaniards, Massilians, Illyrians that we visited in our travels. So we know in one of the things that Shakespeare read that those two places are connected. So this is absolutely an ensemble play. So often you get theater troops or productions where you want to go see a star performance. Here's the thing, there isn't a clear star for this play. And I wanted to bring in this, this breakdown to, to show that fact. So Sir Toby is the one who has the most lines, but uh, as one of the actors who's played that role, Oliver Ford Davies says, Toby is not only very hard work for the actor, he has the most lines, but he also ends up being hated by the audience and he doesn't even get many laughs as he feeds the jokes rather than delivers them. So he might have the, the largest part, at least before um, different adapters start cutting things down, but he's not normally the star. Often you see the person who is playing Viola and Cesario build at the top, and, and that's good reason, as you see with these statistics. There's also um, a huge part for Olivia, as you see, almost, almost the same amount as Viola. Festy the clown, who um, is, is the traditional fool and visits both houses and comments on the action. And then you get Malvolio with 11% and the romantic lead Orsino with 9%. So that is a lot of different parts to be sharing. So this is really a play without a star part, though, as you will see a little bit later on, Malvolio often, even though he only has the, what is this, fifth most lines, often does steal the show. So keep that in mind. And before we go on, I want to go ahead and get to question number two on this, which is how how many times is Viola's name spoken on the play and with a bonus of when is it first spoken? And do keep in mind, Viola is going by the name Cesario a lot of the time. And so I'm not including references to Cesario. But other than speech headings, if you're reading it, if you are watching the play, when is the first time that you hear the name Viola? Or do they even speak it at all? So I have five choices here. Never, one time, three times, five times, and seven times. So Caitlin, do we have any answers here? Well, first we should just uh, point out to all of the attendees, please drop your answers in the chat. 
Um, so if you do, you know, hear a question coming um, and you think, oh, that's what they're about to ask and you're following along, drop the answers in the chat um, for our attendees in our Zoom. For those of us hanging out with us on Facebook or on YouTube, you are also welcome to drop your chat answers there or any questions that you may have. Um, and I'm following along there to give them to Jennifer. I will also say that, uh, I'll turn my camera on for a second. So I will also say that um, I do not know the answer <laughs> to this question. I have a theory, mm -hmm. but I don't know the answer to this question. I actually was like, is my script in here? It's not, I don't know. And this is one that surprised me too. I, before I was putting this together, I hadn't really noticed it ever. So do we have any, uh, any of our attendees wanna take a crack at it in the chat? Uh, let's see what you think. Um, we've got some some names I recognize and some names I, I have seen uh, as some of our buddies of the Bard and some of our actors. Uh, we do have one of our attendees in Zoom that I have no idea what time it is where she is. Maybe it's a normal time, but she's coming to us from Germany. So uh, thanks. Oh, she just, and she's like, I'm leaving. Um, so we just had one of our actors from our Shakespeare Out Loud that was hanging out with us from Germany. Um, uh, but yeah, so I don't have any uh, answers in the chat they maybe they can't and they should be able to so i'll check on that okay um yeah i'll check on that so i'll go ahead and reveal this it is not never it is not one time it is actually the answer this smack in the middle it is three times but we don't hear it until the very last act of the play when you get a reference to um to sebastian saying um saying that he had a sister named Viola. And then all of a sudden, within about 13 lines, you get her name three times in a row. Um, and to really celebrate the fact that she is there. But I think it is interesting that for a major Shakespearean heroine, you don't know her name unless you're reading and see the speech prefixes. Um, you don't know her name until the very end of the play when it's revealed to everybody else as well. And I just find that really interesting. So let's see. Um, I want to talk about this and then we'll get to the next trivia question. You might think I, I've skipped it. I have not. Um, but I want to first talk about Twelfth Night because, of course, back in Shakespeare's time, everyone would have known that this was also a holiday. And it's something that is not widely celebrated in America, though some people do, but it is celebrated in other places around the world. It is the Feast of Epiphany on January 6th. It is also called Twelfth Night because it is the 12th day after Christmas. This is when um, the wise men came to find baby Jesus. And so in some cultures, this is actually celebrated as much as or more than, than Christmas itself. And so this is already a holiday time for celebrations for merriment. But on top of that is also a holiday associated with the Lord of Misrule. And in some places, the Lord of Misrule is crowned on January 6th. In other places, it's January 1st. And then there are a few other differences. But with this, everything is topsy-turvy for the day. You pick someone who would never be in charge and make them in charge for one day or in some other cases for, for a limited period of time. But everything is crazy and different from what it normally would be, which absolutely reflects what is going on in this play. And so that may be where the title comes from. Another theory is maybe it was first performed on the holiday of Twelfth Night because the, the queen and other landed gentry would often have celebrations for this and would put on a play. So it may have been first performed there. And the other theory that, that I've read about is some people think that Shakespeare was commissioned to write a play really fast, commissioned on December 26th, and he finished it up and it was written in the in the 11 days and it was performed on the you guessed it 12th night i doubt that's the case but it's worth mentioning on the off chance so before i go on to the next file i do want to ask the question for number three what is the full title of 12th night and no it's not just 12th night sorry so. so there's a bunch of, from what I understand, there are also lots of movie, the movie adaptations, I think feel like I tend to 
use this title a lot more, right? Am I crazy? Um, um, one I also of them like, uses just that. Right. Actually. Yes. Um, none of them uses just that, but I do feel like there Ooh. are a couple, yeah, that have it um, as the full title of the show. Um, and then I know that I have watched two online productions in my lifetime that included the entire title from theater companies. Um, so I know that there are a couple of them around. Oh, we've got one. James Rowland said, as you will. What? And then Cora Frank said, what you will. So which one? So what is it? Where is it? What is it, Jennifer? It is indeed. And you're going to see it in the center of the screen. Oh, I believe in, let's see. Why is it not? There we go. Twelfth Night or What You Will. So both, even the first answer was almost perfect. But yes, the second answer was absolutely perfect. And I want to talk about two interesting things with this name. So you're, I'm so sorry. Your screen share isn't sharing right now. Oh, fun. Okay, I have stopped and am going back to it. There, let's do that. Let's see if it fixes it. Okay. Did that work? And then we're going to the right slide. There, okay. there we go. There it is. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for letting me know. No, it's so, not. it actually might have been going and I might have just been wrong. <laughs> I'd rather have it right. So this is actually the only double titled play in all of Shakespeare's work. There are other plays that have a title that, that we use a different one today, like the one that we call Henry VIII, um, Shakespeare called All is True. And there were similar things for the different parts of Henry IV and Henry VI. But this is the only one that he deliberately gave two titles to, and that is the case in the folio. And you're going to hear, um, information from a contemporary witness to one of the performances that lists both names there as well. And I just wanted to talk about two connections with this unique title. And the first one is John Marston's that you see on your screen. He wrote a play entitled What You Will. It was not printed until 1607, but we know it was written and performed much earlier. So it actually might have been around before this and Shakespeare was riffing on that and teasing his friend. Um, or maybe Marston was just inspired by this play. The other one we know for a fact was around before Twelfth Night, and that is Ben Johnson. And this is a playwright friend of Shakespeare, personal friend. Um, Cynthia's Revels or the Fountain of Self-Love. And this play was printed in 1600. So this was around right before Shakespeare was writing. And this is the first known play that had two titles. And some people may have found it absolutely pretentious. So this may be Shakespeare absolutely having a go at his friends and not only giving it two titles, but having that second title be eh, whatever you want, what you will. And I really like the idea of this title that we've been talking about for over 400 years being a burn at one of his friends. I just think that's awesome. So next, um, we're getting to Shakespeare sources. Okay, I do before you may or may not know what this is on your screen uh, about how it relates to being a source for Shakespeare on your screen. But if you can tell me for number four, one of Shakespeare's sources for this, and if you list this one, you have to tell me why. So anyone want to put in the chat one of Shakespeare sources, or you may be fancy and know all of them. If so, please feel free. Yeah, I've always thought that this was um, that this was always really interesting. <laughs> uh, because I, um, in school, whenever I would learn about the the little random things that I would um, pay attention to, which was clearly not into a doctorate level like you, it was always uh, focused around the acting. Um, was the the birthplace and then the I don't. I've always just thought it was really really neat, really interesting, and I feel like I always get shorted on that. So thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> Well, and we, we only know bits and pieces about Shakespeare's life. There are plenty of people from this era that we know nothing about. So we actually know a relative lot about William Shakespeare, but not as much as like somebody who would be in the spotlight today. And so it is interesting to see because there aren't that many of his plays that relate 
to his real life. So have we had anybody come in with, with any of Shakespeare sources out of curiosity? No, not yet. Okay. It doesn't look like it. So what do we think? Okay. So, so th this is this is the first one then to talk about, and we'll get to um, the more concrete sources in a minute. But the fact is um, Shakespeare had three kids, a, an older daughter, Susanna, and then twins, a boy and a girl, just like Viola and Sebastian. And unfortunately, he knew a lot about a sister losing her twin brother because um, when, when he was 11, Hamnet Shakespeare died, presumably of the plague. And so this had happened um, less than 10 years before Shakespeare's writing, um, about six years before Shakespeare's writing. And actually one of the interesting things about the play is that at the first known performance, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, at that time, Hamnet and Judith, um, Judith was and Hamnet would have been 17 years old. So about the same age as Viola and Sebastian. So this is very much tied to his daughter and to the son that he lost. And like I said, very little in Shakespeare's work is so directly autobiographical as this is. And he also made this change in all of his other sources. It was about a brother and sister who looked alike, but were not twins. And, this, and that is one thing that he brought to it. So the first big book source of, for the play, and please, if you know Italian, I apologize for, um, for massacring um, Inga Nadi. And this is a play that was set in Siena, uh, or performed in Siena, set in, set in Venice um, from 1537. It translates in English, as you see on your screen, to The Deceived. And there are a lot of clear um, pieces of evidence that show that connection to Shakespeare directly so that we know he was aware of this. Uh, one of the interesting things is in this source and in none of the other sources, there are references right at the beginning to the Feast of the Epiphany, also known as Twelfth Night. And in the second bit, you can see some slight similarities. Lelia, the disguised page, loves Flaminio Orsinio, who loves Isabella um, Olivia, who loves Lelia. So you've already got this whole relationship. And in addition to that, you have her, her brother Fabrizio when he comes in, mistaken for her disguised as Fabio, and the brother marries Isabella, the Olivia character. In addition to that, in this version, you have stand-ins for Sir Toby and Sir Andrew with Elizabeth, Isabella Olivia character, her father and his servant. They act in a very similar way. And, uh, and that father's maid is very like the character of Mariah. So there are a lot of direct connections to this. There are even more connections than to, to this Elizabethan source, which is Barnaby Rich, Rich, his farewell to the military profession, and this comes up in several of Shakespeare's um, plays, not just this one, but this is particularly the, the story that you see on this page here about Apollonius and Scylla, or Sia. Um, in some of the sections, the wording is so close that it is so apparent that Shakespeare had a copy of this in front of him. It also has the shipwreck, and then like um, Inganati, it has Sila's disguise, Sylvia's mistaken identity, and it ends in the two marriages. So Shakespeare was familiar with both of these works. Another one that comes in, and if you know about Shakespeare's other comedies, the Menechmi or the Menechmus brothers um, is the main source for Comedy of Errors. Um, this ancient play by Plautus, one of our earliest comedies, um, is all about twins being mistaken from one another. And Shakespeare had written Comedy of Errors many years earlier. He's clearly going back to that with this as well. And then the last of the sources is the famous history of Parsimus from 1598. It also has, has a bit with the disguised page, but that part ends differently. What we know Shakespeare took of this is the two names, Olivia, who's a queen in it, and um, Violetta, um, that becomes Viola. And in this one, she becomes Parsimus's page, 
But in this one, they don't end up together. Instead, she totally falls for his best friend and he marries the girl that he was originally supposed to marry. So far less interesting. I mean, really. So who wants things to happen the way they're supposed to? That's no, that's yeah. So we have these this variety of sources but then you get one more which is this story about malvolio and i had to include the gif with the cross garters um this we do not have any source for so i like to think that this is absolutely from the mind of a comic genius named william shakespeare who knows we might find another source that's been on somebody's shelf but um there is nothing like this plot beforehand. So the other thing I wanna talk about while we're thinking about sources is music in this play. So many of Shakespeare's plays, especially the comedies, but not only the comedies, are musicals because they have music straight through. This one does. The very first line of the play is the ultra famous one that you see on your screen. If music be the food of love, play on, give me excess of it. And we do have excessive music, not that that's a bad thing. And it ends with a song with um, Festy singing about the wind and the rain. Interestingly, that same song with slightly different lyrics at parts is also sung by the Fool character in King Lear, a very different type of play. I've always been interested in that connection and probably played by the same actor. So music is throughout this play. And this is also the play where people stop and you watch characters listening to music. The central scene in the play where Orsino and Cesario are listening to the music and falling more in love, as you see depicted in this picture on your screen, um, it is a major example of that. But there are all sorts of questions about music in Shakespeare, as well as this particular music, um, whether or not Shakespeare wrote these lyrics, whether the music was composed by someone in the company, or whether these were already popular songs that he's absolutely stealing to put in his soundtrack. And also at a time for recorded music, music was a big draw for people coming to the theater. So if you wanna go hear your favorite song, go see Shakespeare. So there's no telling at this point um, from the evidence we currently have, which of those it would be. One thing I can tell you is that unlike music from a few of the other shows, we don't have any extant um, copies of sheet music for any, any melodies or anything. So we don't know what these sounds originally, songs originally sounded like. So that gives in, in some way a lot of license to productions to compose their own music, to go with this, to fit whatever setting they're putting in, whether it's Edwardian, whether it's disco, um, or whether it's Shakespeare's own period or now, people can be really creative with it in a way that and they I, might be. Um, can I interject the um, the Please. last time we did the show, what we did with it? So the last time we did the show, not this current production, we did it set at a beach. So um, uh, when we did Hi-Ho, the Wind and the Rain at the end, we did it to the tune of uh, Gilligan's Island. I love it. Uh, and I, I was, remember that, was, that. Yeah. And that was the first year that I stage managed for that was my, actually my very first season on the square was uh, the last time we did the show. And I remember thinking like, that's weird. Who does that? And then <laughs> now that I'm here, I'm like, why didn't I think of this sooner? I wish this had been my idea. Mm -hmm. This is a Love great it. idea. Love it. So music is a big part and please keep that in mind and listen out for the different settings. And if you go to YouTube or iTunes or Spotify, all of those places, you can hear different versions of the different songs that exist. Um, so this play was first in print in the first folio of Shakespeare, the collected works after his death. And this is in 1623. It was put together by his friends, by people who were fellow shareholders in the company. And this is by far not the only play that was first printed at this time. This was a time when people didn't 
necessarily think to put plays in print unless one, the theaters were closed and you had no other sorts of income, or two, you had people trying to make money off of you by printing bad folios, by people either standing in the theater and trying to memorize as much as possible and then writing it down, or bribing actors to write down everything that they can remember of the play. So, um, it is interesting. We only have this one version. There are other ver um, other plays where we have multiple versions and you have to figure out which version to use. This one, we just have the one. And there is evidence that it is it was taken from Shakespeare's manuscript, but they had added in different things um, once the play was in production. But there are some errors that Shakespeare made while writing the play, like going from Duke Orsino at the beginning and all of his speech headings or prefixes say Duke to later on people calling him Count. And despite what we modern Americans might think, they are very different um, offices to hold. So there's some errors like that. There are also some discrepancies where some references um, talk about three days that the whole play takes place and another one says three months. So there's some errors that no one got around to fixing that are probably from his, um, from his rough draft that got through. So a good, um, I'm sorry, I'm an English professor. It's a good reminder to always um, proofread. Um, even Shakespeare, even Shakespeare. So again, 1623 is the first time in print, but clearly it was performed in Shakespeare's lifetime. And there are lots of people who speculate when it was first performed. And this theory by Leslie Hodson that was first put out in the middle of the 20th century, um, it gained a lot of steam because man, it would just be so perfect. That said, I think it is too good to be true, but it is still worth mentioning. And this is the theory that we know that Queen Elizabeth was having big Twelfth Night revels at court in the year 1601 on Twelfth Night itself, January 6th, and that one of her, um, one of the people there with her was a Duke Orsini, or in some places it was written Duke Orsino, um, who was a visiting ambassador from, from an area of what we now call Italy. So yeah, wouldn't that be just too perfect if a character named Duke Orsino um, debuted on Twelfth Night in a play called Twelfth Night in front of that Duke? So um, that said, the timing doesn't properly line up when, when you look at things. It was probably written in the mid to later part of that year. So it's far more likely, actually, that Shakespeare was there on the Twelfth Night and remembered Duke Orsino and thus made him a part to be kind of a, hey, you're, you're in the in crowd if you know this joke um, to put in there. But the first performance that we know about actually happened in, um, and this is the bonus question for number five. We'll come back to the regular part. What was the location of the first recorded performance of Twelfth Night? Any guesses? Just as a reminder, you can throw it in the chat. You can yeah. also, um, we do have a Q&A section um, open to you. So if you would like to uh, open up the Q&A, you can do that as well. Um, let's see. So let's see. I don't see any um, dropping in the chat at the moment okay. Not yet. Okay. Well, I am totally going to spoil this. I'm sorry. I did warn. Um, this <laughs> was at the Middle Temple Hall. And Middle Temple is part of the Inns of Court where all the lawyers would meet. And we actually know about this from the journal, the diary of a law student, John Manningham. And I, I got the, the photo of the plaque that is actually in that room. Um, but we also have his diary page. And in the middle of the page, you see February 1602. I I know his his one his twos look like ones, but it is 1602. Um, on the second day, February 2nd, 1602, um, there's this entry, and I have this um, 
translation because man Elizabethan paleography is not the easiest to interpret I've I've had classes and it still takes me a while so at our feast we had a play called Twelfth Night or What You Will and see note both titles are listed here um, much like the Comedy of Errors or Menechmi and Plautus but most like and near to that in Italian called Ignati a good practice in it to make the steward believe his lady widow was in love with him. Okay, she's not a widow, but close enough. She's in mourning. Um, by counterfeiting a letter as from his lady in general terms, telling him what she liked best in him and prescribing his gesture in smiling, his apparel, and then when it came to practice, making him believe that they took him to be mad. So he's got the right play. It is clearly Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. And, um, and he, he does pretty well for, for a law student who wasn't studying drama. That's, that's pretty good. And I do think it's absolutely fascinating that this is what law students decided to do to celebrate. Hire some actors and put on a play. <laughs> So before I click to the next screen, let's look at the rest of that question for number five. So you already know the bonus. It's the Middle Temple Hall, which still exists. Um, so for the 400th anniversary of the play's first known performance, so this will be January 2nd, 2002, a production was held at that same location starring two future Oscar winners. Name one or both of them. So. Do we have any answers? Well, I guess I gotta give them just a second to, to yeah. give it a try. Oh, um, why wouldn't so, people just immediately click on yes and not spend any time typing? I, I know, right? Yeah. Well, and I, so, well, <laughs> I guess the question is next time I should, uh, I should create the little <laughs> polls, but then if I create a poll, we have to give them options and that's so fun. I know, and that's not fun. I will give you a hint. One of these two future Oscar winners at that time um, actually has a birthday on Twelfth Night, a January 6th birthday. Oh, okay. So if you're a big, um, if you're really into knowing everyone's birthdays, then that might help. I did put the question in the chat for those of you who need to read it to get it. Uh, that's me for sure. So for the 400th anniversary of the play's first known performance, a production was held in that same location starring two future Oscar winners. And to be clear, they were then future Oscar winners. They have since won Oscars. I'm not projecting who's going to win in future years. <laughs> well, all right, let's give it a shot. So um, is one of them, I don't, I don't know, Ian McKellen's always a safe bet, right? Is that, that is a safe bet. And we know for a fact, he played Malvolio in the late seventies. Uh, or no maybe he played sir toby belch when he was around 40 so okay a really young sir toby um but no not in this no one. no it's always a safe bet though so i i commend your guessing um do, oh is one of them a dame okay I should warn you that they were trying as much as possible to stick with original practices. So all of the clothes were made, like no sewing machines, everything made the way it would have been. But one of the other things was it was an all male cast. They didn't uh. go as far as doing boy actors in it. Um, one of these actors was a very young Viola at 20. Um, but they did have adults playing because, yeah, I don't think we really want to see boy actors playing the female parts um, at this point. Sorry. No, not, not a cool thing to do anymore. All right. So um, I've got uh, Chris Colton on, on Facebook said, Sir Lawrence, why not? So Olivier, this is, this one's too late, right? But so the, for it to be Olivier. Yeah. But, that's but a great again, guess. always a trying, solid Chris. guess. Yes. All right. So what is it? Yeah, I give up. Okay. So it's not, I was going for Judy Dench. So it's not Judy Dench. No, right, she's so. done almost everything in Shakespeare and you are going to see a photo of her as Viola later on, but no, alas, it was actually Eddie Redmayne while he was still in drama school um, as a young, fresh-faced Viola and Mark Rylance, who has now worked with Steven Spielberg for a lot of movies and gotten an Oscar for one of those as Olivia um, and actually in the long shot where you can see the full um, hall that everyone is in, it is the two of them in that scene. 
Uh, and and by the way, Mark Rylance at the time was also the artistic director of the Globe Theater. So he is the person who had put all of this together and made it happen. Um, but it was a really celebrated production. It then transferred to the Globe without Eddie Redmayne with a few roles were cast later that summer. I was lucky enough to watch it there. And then they remounted it um, in 2013 and took it both to London and New York where it was really well celebrated. But one of the things I want to note about this. So again, they were trying to make it as original practice as possible with the one exception not being boys, um, but having men instead was when you see Cesario and Sebastian next to one another as you do in the upper right hand corner, you see for once how people could be so tricked, so fooled because they look exactly alike. And I think that that's a really interesting effect. There, there are several comments from people who were in the audience saying, when, when one came out, I didn't know which one it was. And so that can have a huge effect, especially if you're only used to seeing productions where they do as well as they can with the actors they have, but they may not have two people who look just alike. And certainly the powdered face um, helps create that illusion as well. So interestingly, early references to the play all are connected to Malvolio. The, the earliest one here is from this poem by Leonard Diggs from 1640, where he names like all the highlights of Shakespeare. So he will name like one or two characters from each play. And this is what we get from Twelfth Night. The cockpit galleries boxes are all are full. So people show up to hear Malvolio, that cross gartered gull. And gull would be a fool, someone who is tricked. So that is one of the earliest references to Malvolio in print. And you also get King Charles I, while he was imprisoned um, in a year or two before his death, they gave him reading material. And one of the things was the second folio that he annotated. And I've circled here that next to the title, he has identified this as Malvolio to quickly remind himself in the same way that he did Beatrice and Benedict for Much Ado About Nothing, Rosalind for As You Like It, and that sort of thing. And also we have in here, um, I'm sorry, it's not a higher quality resolution picture, but this was the best I could find. This is the earliest printed image we have associated with Twelfth Night from Nicholas Rowe's edition. There was only one image in that, um, in that bound book. And it was a Malvolio locked in the dark room, sitting on rushes with Festy um, pretending to be Sir Topaz on the other side of the wall with Sir Toby. Um, and Mariah, and it's not necessarily the image I would think of. I think nowadays one of the go-to things is the yellow cross garters, um, yellow stockings with cross garters, which is of course what I went with. Um, but it is interesting to see that that was the image that they wanted to represent the play in that first time we have an image of the play. So I'm quickly going to go through a few of the trends and um, the first thing to mention is, um, well, before we go with things that are on the screen, Malvolio got his revenge. He is called in the play a kind of Puritan. And of course, a little bit after Shakespeare's time, the Puritans closed down all of the theaters in England for years because they thought it was corrupting the, the people. And so Malvolio gets his revenge, the theaters are closed, but when they're reopened in the restoration, you finally get women who can play parts on the stage. And of course, women in trousers, you get to see their legs. So Viola becomes one of the, along with Rosalind and As You Like It, becomes one of those cherished britches roles where the women get to play get to wear britches and the guys get to ogle their legs so just know that was a reason for it to be popular but it didn't work right away there were only three productions we know of actually during the restoration we know of them from samuel peeps's journal and he hated every single one we don't know the state of it um they were probably adaptations that were heavily cut and may have had things added in but the first hit after the reopening of the theaters was all the way in 1741 with two of the biggest stars 
um, in the theater, Kitty Clive and Hannah Pritchard as the two female leads. And because they could sing too, they gave them so many of Festy's songs. So um, you get their roles increased with the songs and as long as possible for Hannah Pritchard to be on stage in Britches. But you also had Charles Macklin as Malvolio just a few months before he became the single biggest star playing um, Shylock, another character that mixes comedy and tragedy together. So you can assume he probably brought some of those characteristics to this performance. So the thing about the music and giving it to the women that absolutely continued when you had Dorothy Jordan playing Viola in, in 1785 and she became really celebrated in this part. The downside of the women singing the song is what gets us to number six. And I'm sorry, I'm not giving us proper time to answer that one, but which character's impact expanded greatly to become a star role in the 20th century after being heavily kept from the show during the previous 200 years? I actually uh, posted it in the chat just a oh, few minutes ago. So it's been up there for a little bit because I'm learning. Okay. So I'm learning Do you have lesson. an answer? So I don't have an answer, but they've been seeing it. So does anyone quick in our Zoom want to throw in an answer? Um, uh, I think you might be able to get it. Five, four three, two, one. Nope. All right. So what do we got? So we got the person who originally sang those songs, Festy. And so his point, his part gets cut back and cut back and cut back so that he is barely in the story at all for um, up until around the 20th century, really. And then he becomes this main role that we'll talk about a little bit later. But another step with that is, as you see with the information at the center of the page, this adaptation by John Philip Kimball from 1815, and he made so many of these changes that people did for the next hundred years, including this first one. That is something that directors still do to this day. If you want to put Viola first and front and center, switch the order of the two first two scenes. So you don't start with if music be the food of love play on. You start with her struggling in from the water saying what country friends is this? and trying to figure out where she is and how to manage without her brother. So just flipping those scenes made a huge impact and again, kept on with that. And so Kimball, that was only the start of the changes that he made to really focus in on her character. Similarly, you have a good actor playing Sir Andrew. So you bulk up his part. He's getting laughs, give him more to do. Cut back Festy because yeah, a lot of his jokes are old fashioned. Let's not do that. And also you get Antonio, the, the sea captain who Orsino calls a pirate. Um, he says he's not a pirate, even though in, in a lot of modern productions, you somehow see a little parrot on his shoulder in an eye patch, including that version that Caitlin was talking about with Gilligan's Island. And There's I made good. that parrot and we still have him. He's in the office. Love it. Um, the other it day, worked. Tom pulled him out and I said, it's my parrot in my eye patch. And I love that he keeps on saying, I'm not a pirate with the eye patch and parrot, just saying. But he is a character who also has these beautiful speeches about how much he cares about Sebastian. And I guess it probably made Victorian audiences a bit uncomfortable that this man goes on and on about his love for a young man. So for some reason, they cut that back a bit. Um, so that was a major trend in the 19th century. And then as it goes on, another main trend is having very feminine violas. You don't, I mean, this is Victorian era. You want your women to be very womanly. You want them to be the angels of the house. And you certainly want to find an outfit that they can wear as a boy that still makes them look girl-like. And so they go with these kind of Turkish tunics that was that were first popularized. Actually, I couldn't find a, a photo or a drawing of her. Um, well, I guess it would have been a drawing of Ellen Tree, not to be confused with Ellen Terry, Ellen Tree, um, who debuted the role in 1840 in exactly this type of 
costume. And then for the next hundred years, all you see are these Turkish inspired costumes that create a little bit of a skirt, but still get to see the legs because I mean, clearly the, the men have spoken, but you have Cesarios that no one is ever going to guess are really men if you really take a look at them. I also love that Kate Terry, this is the first one that we know of where the same actor played both Viola and Sebastian um, and they had a dummy at, for the last scene where she is seeing her twin. Um, that's since been done often, but but Kate Terry all the way back in, six, in 1865 originated this. I also wanna give a shout out to Charlotte Cushman um, who was the most famous American actress of the 19th century and she was most famous actually for playing Romeo. She would play Romeo to her sister's Juliet and they toured this all around the U.S. and Great Britain. She performed on demand for, for Queen Victoria for Abraham Lincoln. She was friends with the biggest stars of her age. She was a huge star and um, so when people saw her they would know that oh yeah she is known for, for playing men and, and I think that that is um, kind of an interesting connection with that part. So all of these trends absolutely continue with the next woman I want to mention, um, who was in America at that time, Julia Marlowe, who I think gets the um, Twelfth Night crown for hardest working. She performed the role of Viola from 1887 to 1919. Those are the recorded performances. She did this over 20 years to sell out crowds. And then by the end, when she was 52, they're like, well, she's, she's a little long in the teeth for that. But I did try to bring in photos of her from the beginning of her run. The one on the left is um, from 1891 uh, and the other one is undated, but to give an idea of how she might have changed during those years. But even from the beginning, really celebrated. I think it's interesting that in the playbill here from 1889, just two years into that 32 year run, her name is so much bigger than the guy playing Malvolio. So she was definitely the star draw here. And as the actor yeah. currently playing Olivia, I'm very sad to see Olivia's name all the way at the bottom. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, and, and, and Mariah, who's here called Marie, it, it only gets billing right underneath there. But, and I, I love Mariah. She's one of my favorite. Yes. It does. I don't think it's interesting that those two are MISS. So it's almost like maybe they were the, their debuts of those actors, but. I think that's really interesting. No. That's too cool. Absolutely. Um, so actually, you, you got a sneak peek of it. But before I go back to that next slide, let's look at number seven. This is possibly my favorite of all of these trivia questions. What landmark production of Twelfth Night featured real grass and fountains on stage? I love this one. All right. So we've had this one up for just a little bit. Um, for Facebook, it's only been up for about three minutes. Um, but we've had this up for a minute. So has anyone uh, got a, got a, want to take a stab at it? I'm going to check it out. The real Shakespeare performance history nerds. Yes. So what landmark production of Twelfth Night featured real grass and fountains on stage? Um, as someone who is often doing a lot of the technical stuff for um, Tennessee Stage, I can tell you that if our artistic director, Tom Parkhill, who appears to be tuned in, was the one that looked at me and said, hey, I want to put real fountains on stage. And I would go, and I want a million dollars. Well, and one of the amazing things about this production, they spent an insane amount of money, but it was such a big hit. They made it back in three weeks. I do not understand how that happened, but in three weeks, and I will say one of my treasured theater possessions is I actually have the play, the souvenir playbill that, that they did for the 50th performance that has all of these um, amazing things and at the end sheet music at the back for the melody that for that they used. Ah, there we go. So yeah. If, if anybody is just dying to see this, feel free to email me and we'll, we'll set up a visitation. It's it's truly awesome. Yes, for a small donation, you can have uh, drinks with Jennifer and I, or drinks with me and Jennifer will tell you things that are much more enter entertaining. Um, all right, so what is it? Which What's the landmark production, Dr. 
Dr. Horn. Okay. This was Herbert Beerbone Tree. Um, and if that is not an awesome name, I don't know what is. He starred as Malvolio. He also directed the production. And that is a picture, a drawing of him on the set that you see in this um, lovely deluxe print that they put out in that souvenir playbill uh, from 1901. And what I find absolutely fascinating about this is you can see in the distance here, the figure of Malvolio. This part on stage is probably where the scenery started. So everything behind him, like these steps would be part of the backdrop, but everything from there forward was real. He came down all of these steps that were covered with grass. There was this real working fountain over here. There were all of these things. And so clearly once, oh, sorry, clearly once you have this um, set in place, you cannot move it easily. So they set a lot of the play in this location as you should. And yet, as you could, um, it, if, if you want to look at my souvenir playbill, they have some other sets that were absolutely fantastic too. I just want to know where they kept all of this when they weren't on stage because Victorian theaters are known for having tiny backstage areas. And we know that um, another production, um, one of As You Like It, from around the same time period, they had live plants and at, in that production, after the play each night, they moved it all to the roof so that it could get sun for the next day and have a place to stay. And then they moved it all back down to be on stage. So I am just, the realism that they were going for with this is absolutely great. And you get um, long before Despicable Me, his Malvolio had minions. He had four smaller actors in identical outfits to him who followed him around for comic effect doing the same actions that he did. So I just imagine them bright yellow and, and far smaller than any humans could possibly be. Um, but yeah, interesting production and certainly on my short list of, of historical productions, I wish I could have seen. And the when you have productions, and this was not the only one trying to get that level of realism, when they are so trying to make the stage into outdoors inside, like you can't go any farther with that and stay indoors. So the pendulum absolutely starts swinging the other way with far less realistic things. And so you get this absolutely important production in 1912 of Harley Granville Barker at the Savoy. He was such a pioneer with Shakespeare um, and had new ways of looking at the plays and the visual was a huge part of it. And so really making a statement with this and changing interpretations. And so this is such an important um, production. But before I go on to the next one, I want to look at number eight, and hopefully we can get one or two people getting this one right. I'm occasionally a little bit nicer. What play started the London tradition of Shakespeare and Regent's Park in 1932? Any guesses, any play in the history of the world by any author, what play might it possibly be? What play could we possibly be discussing today? Um, it is cool that this question regards Shakespeare in the Park because this summer, you know, we are going to be um, Shakespeare and Imes Nature Center, Shakespeare off the square, as it were. Um, so if you do uh, love learning about this play and you want to see our production of it, we would absolutely love that. And I do, I did get an answer for you, get an answer uh, on Facebook. So if you do want to join us for that, we would absolutely love it. We open July 8th and run through August 8th. Uh, and Twelfth Night is the show that opens the season. So opening night, uh, come check us out at Imes Nature Center. And uh, Chris on Facebook said Twelfth Night. <gasps> yes! And I love this photo at the bottom of how many people showed up. 
So this wasn't just the first time for Shakespeare at Regent's Park. This was the first time for Shakespeare in the park. And of course, in the in the late 60s, early 70s, that migrates to New York City with the public theater and Shakespeare in the park there. And then it goes everywhere, including to Tennessee Stage Company doing Shakespeare in the Park in 1990 at the Amphitheater at the World's Fair Park. So and, and absolutely to IMS today. So I love that they did set a good precedent because man, can you imagine if this hadn't been a good production and people hadn't wanted to come back if it got lousy reviews, we could have lost this whole tradition. But they had fun. They did a great job. And you can see pictures of, of two of the actors there at the top. So I, I am absolutely thrilled about this precedent from 1932. So from there, in the 20th century, you get a lot of huge shifts, including much darker views of the play. And one thing I wanted to really mention is the influence of the plays of Anton Chekhov on on productions of Twelfth Night. Um, most of Chekhov's plays are ensembles that are mixed um, with comedy and tragedy, really dark sense of humor. Um, and that matches with Twelfth Night so well. And so you have some notable productions like the Guthrie version of the Old Vic from 1937 that had um, not only Olivier, but Jessica Tandy, um, Maurice Evans, John Gilgood, um, really amazing people in this. And while they were performing this, they were rehearsing um, Cherry Orchard and it really influenced their performances. Later on, you get John Barton directing Judy Dench as Viola, who you see um, behind the, the couch there in a very Chekhov influenced um, Twelfth Night in 1969. And um, such that the Malvolio was so bleak that um, people got the impression that when Malvolio leaves the stage the last time, he's probably going to go off stage and kill himself, um, including the actor who played him, Donald Sinden. He says, um, all of his dignity is gone. Everything that he stood for has disintegrated. What is there left for him to do? Nothing. I saw it as a very tragic ending. Malvolio is a man without any sense of humor, therefore a tragic man. And that Chekhov and, and sense of potential suicide very much ties in with plays like The Seagull. And I, and I put up a quote um, from, from that play there, but it goes even further with this production from Christopher Martin in New York in 1973, where after Malvolio leaves, you actually hear an offstage gunshot. So for a raucously silly play, this got really dark really quickly. I also want to give a shout out to the Donmar production at the bottom of the screen. This was a play that normally did one play at a time. They decided specifically in 2002 to do two plays in repertory. So you go see one one night, you go see the other one the next night. And it was um, Uncle Vanya and, and Twelfth Night with the same cast. And I put up the two photos there. One of those is from Uncle Vanya and the other one is, is from Twelfth Night. And I don't think it's that easy to guess. They're both um, had costumes from that same time period. Um, oh, we're not there quite yet. Yeah, we're not there yet, but I'm going to go ahead and leave okay. that up just so people can check it out if okay. they want to answer it. Okay, so with this one um yeah really closely associated and the other thing i wanted to mention with this is that one other character other than malvolio often becomes tragic in this and that is antonio who has such love who speaks so eloquently about his love for sebastian who sees sebastian married to olivia by the end of the play and himself leaves on his own and so, so many productions, including this one for the Royal Exchange in Manchester, um, really take time to let you feel Antonio's pain with that, that that is a small tragedy in the midst of happier things happening. So, let's see. 
ooh, it does not want me to go forward. There we go. Uh, the other major trend, and this one slightly more recently, so this is since um, Stonewall happened in the US and the, um, the law changes around 1969, 1970 in the UK, until that time it was illegal to be a homosexual. Um, so since that time, these ideas of gender identity and queer representation that have always been part of the play. We have in the original production, a boy dressed as a girl, dressed as a boy, um, who is who has a woman in love with him, um, which is really a man dressed as a woman or a boy dressed as a woman in love with him, as well as a man who is in love with him as a boy. Th this is all there already but it was finally a time when people could take this out in the open. So it has been absolutely fascinating to see the different ways that, um, that directors and actors have worked on this um, from around 1970 forward. And starting in, I think it was 1972, you have kisses between Antonio and Sebastian on stage. And um, this production by Simon Godwin for NT Live and the National Theater in 2017 did such a beautiful job of doing that. And um, there is a really great behind the scenes thing about the actor playing Sebastian, playing him as questioning someone who never considered um, being in a relationship with another man and working through his feelings. And so even though he ends up married to a woman, this is this is a different part of the journey it also in the last scene you you see some sparks fly between um sebastian and orsino when orsino mistakenly thinks that that is cesario um so you have some really interesting things i i love this um lindsay posner version from the rsc um at the turn of this century where olivia kisses viola dressed as cesario and for a little while viola absolutely kisses her back before she thinks of orsino and um there's another production that you'll see a, a slide for a little bit later on from 2007 where they make it very clear that um olivia was much happier with with cesario and with the woman she is very disappointed by her husband in in that one um the other thing oh and i the bottom one for the rsc in 2017 they make this really interesting choice in this very first scene where orsino is a painter he is painting um curio one of his pages who is all but naked holding up the bow and and as he is doing this nude portrait. And so clearly he, he is bi or bisexual or pansexual. And so later on when he kisses Cesario, he doesn't panic about the fact that this is a boy. He panics about the fact, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be in love with Olivia. And that's all, so it shifts the issue a little bit. Um, I also want to mention Edward Hall's production for Propeller. This is a theater company that um, just does all male productions of Shakespeare plays. So this was nothing new for them, but having Olivia, as you see in the black dress here, performed without a wig, um, it, it does some interesting things about gender roles and, and everything with that. And I've already spoken about the Tim Carroll production that started in Middle Temple Hall and went to the Globe, uh, where they look so much alike. So you can read different things on it. So I am always fascinated to see what statements might be made, what relationships might be explored in this particular play. So not only that, this play is remarkable for having three really strong, really different female characters. And as you see in this GIF, um, Viola even says in the play with slightly different meaning, but it still stands, I'm the man, um, which of course becomes she's the man in one of the adaptations. You get uh, Olivia, who is so self-aware. She knows everything that's going on. She's commenting on herself as well as on others. And yet she absolutely goes for what she wants and is a strong head of the household. And Mariah, who you see um, playing by Paul Chahidi at the bottom in that um, original Globe production, he was at Mill Temple Hall as well. He's one of my all time favorite theater performances in that role 
where it was just amazing. And Mariah is absolutely in position to steal the show as well, even though she has a smaller part. So this is absolutely a good play for the actresses in the company, even if, even if they end up doing an all male production and the roles get stolen, but still. So here is the problem. You have the strong character of Viola paired with Orsino, bless his heart. Um, Orsino is a great hero for the romantic era. He absolutely throws himself into being lovesick, very much like Romeo in this way. He is going to be moody until he gets the love of his life. And that creates the problem for the actor of how do you make him interesting? How do you get the audience on your side? And how are they not disappointed that when you have a strong woman in Olivia, Cesario instead ends up with Orsino. So I find this absolutely fascinating with every production, how you deal with this, how you make it interesting. This production for the RSC in 2017, and yes, all three of these are, are strong productions from the same year from the three major theater companies um, in, in England who do Shakespeare. But the one from the RSC, they make him an artist with artistic temperament. And so it goes along with the character. For the other two, they make him absolutely a the one word that comes to mind is a doofus he is a lovable doofus um the the one played by oliver crisp in the nt live production who you see waving his hand there he shows up in his first scene with a giant teddy bear to present to the olivia who clearly will not be interested in a giant teddy bear but he is goofy and viola is goofy in a similar way so they work in this version at the globe that's set in the very early 80s he is he has like a power ballad that air supply would be proud of and he really feels it and so they bond through music um, and they just really embrace the silliness in that. So it is interesting to see the different ways of making this part that would originally have been taken far more seriously than, than we do in a post-ironic age. Um, so Dr. Horn, the <laughs> production that you just mentioned where he has a power ballad. So that's one of the productions where they have um, a lot of music, right? Mm -hmm. Like where they've got um, a lot of songs Absolutely. that go into it. So are they turning the... Yes, cool. So are they turning Shakespeare's words into songs or have they written songs that go, oh, okay, so they're turning a lot of the like monologues and stuff into songs. Oh yeah, so cool. and, and his is, if music be the food of love, play on. It is absolutely that speech as a song. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, it's, it's really, really fun. Um, so that, that is with Orsino. Festy, who we've already talked about, kind of disappeared for a while. In traditional productions, he was very much played as the licensed fool or as a court jester. And of course, a licensed fool back then is someone that you would pay to be around to make you laugh. But he was also, as I'm sure you're familiar with, with King Lear, he's the one person who can really speak truth to power. He's the one person who can get away with telling a powerful person when they're an idiot. And so he does this, um, I, I don't know that he does it with Orsino, but he definitely does it with both Olivia and Viola, who is not powerful, but still he calls people out when he sees errors. And he certainly does that with Malvolio as well. So um, it works with that traditional costume. But of course, as, as we nowadays know a lot less about that role, you find different ways to, to modernize it. I also wanted to include the, the portrait of Robert Arman, who, as I had mentioned earlier, was the fool who was new to Shakespeare's company, that Shakespeare was probably writing to his strengths with this. They had had a previous type of fool who was more like, uh, who was known for playing roles like bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream. That is a very different type than you see with Festy, who is witty and will probably stand in one place, but make lots of witty jokes and, and dazzle you with that. Um, 
so I just wanted to bring in some examples of different types of Festi that you might see in different productions. And from that same early 80s set production um, that had that Orsino, you have um, in the corner down here with Emma Rice's production, um, a cabaret performer called La Gato Chocolat, um, chocolate cake who is in the Festi role, absolutely acting as master of ceremonies for the entire thing. At this point, he has the, the awesome Diana Ross wig on. Later on, he loses that. And so you just see a man with very short hair and a beard with the fabulous dress. And again, it, it's further playing with the ideas of gender identity in the play. Um, but again, he acts as a master of ceremonies and is kind of in charge and orchestrating everything that happens in that type of production. You also get um, some that are just the, the wise fool who are observing everything and commenting on it. And that is both um, Adrian Lester in the Ken Branagh production that you see and Ben Kingsley in the Trevor Nunn production that he, forever when I think of Festi, I think of Ben Kingsley in that production that I cannot recommend um, too highly. But you also get some that really have a point of view and a reason for their actions. And um, the, the last two on here, the one for Peter Hall's production in 1960, this is actually a really moralistic fool. He has a line about um, saying like, telling you when you're wrong is actually being your friend. And so in this version, he is helping to trick Malvolio to help him be aware of his errors, of the things that he's doing wrong. And so in that one, he actually is crying at the end because Malvolio didn't learn his lesson. He sheds a tear because he's so disappointed that his lesson didn't work. On the absolute opposite end of the spectrum, you have the Festi from the Don Mar production that was again very Chekhov infused, where he cannot stand Malvolio, who had mocked him at the beginning of the play. So he is doing everything very deliberately to hurt Malvolio. So there is a really interestingly broad spectrum there for the character. You then get the characters of Sir Toby Belch and Sir Andrew Aucheek. Again, AU would be a type of, of sickness where you're wasting away, you'd have very sallow, thin cheeks. So AU cheek was definitely a, a deliberate joke name in the same style as Belch and Bottom. Um, so these are definitely a double act, but 20th century and 21st century productions have really problematized their relationship because you find out at the beginning of the play that Sir Toby is absolutely using Sir Andrew for his money. He, they may also be friends, but he's also trying to bankrupt him to, um, to get money for drinking and revelry and everything. And at the end, Sir Toby actually pushes Sir Andrew away and uh, when they've both been injured and basically saying, you're not worthy of me. So, so many productions now really highlight that difference between the two of them. And because all of that is going on, while Sir Andrew is absolutely a comic creation who just gets to be funny, gets to have the punchlines. And it, as you see with the NT Live and the Globe, evidently nowadays can absolutely get to wear pink to um and wear it well and both of them got to dance well he sir andrew brags about his dancing skills and in some things he absolutely can't in those two he can but sir toby becomes this really problematic character because you have to like be cheering for him to have fun at different points and then he is so mean not only to malvolio but to the person who he pretends or acts as if he is his best friend so again this part is really tricky to pull off i thought that particularly the people in um, the Globe and the NT Live performances did that really well and made them interesting and likable in completely different ways. The one, the Globe is a, an absolute party animal whose heart is in the right place, but he goes too far. And the one in NT Live, they absolutely played him as Keith Richards, um, who, but had had way too much to drink. So kind, kind of an interesting thing. Um, 
But with these characters, you get the scene where Cesario and Sir Andrew are pushed into a sword fight. I will say this is one of my favorite scenes in both the play and in all of Shakespeare because you have such opportunities to make it the worst sword fight in the history of the world in the best possible way. I will forever be bitter that I didn't get to see this Folger 2003 production in Washington where it was um, all disco all the time. And so instead of a sword fight, they had a dance off. And you had two people absolutely terrified of showing off their John Travolta moves and having to be pushed into it. And so um, the descriptions I have read is they absolutely knew what they were supposed to do, all the intricacies, and they absolutely could not achieve it. Um, so man, I wish I could see it. I really love this, this Globe Theater production where they had as a boxing match where um, I did a screen grab from, from the video where they're both shadow boxing in completely different directions. No one is going to hit anything um, and it is awesome. So I always look forward to this scene in productions. There is no way to screw it up. There's just figuring out which fun way they're going to do. So that brings us to the last of the characters I want to discuss, which is Malvolio. And um, of course, he is the one who is most associated with the play. He is the one who is most famous. Charles, the first handwriting of, of Malvolio as an alternate title to the play. Um, but he's tricky to pull off. And so the person I put in the center, all of this, is, and Chris, here is where we finally get Lawrence Olivier as, um, as a member of this cast playing, um, playing Malvolio and not doing it well. Bless his heart. He did so many Shakespearean roles well. This was not oh, one of no. them. I know. So I'm sorry, we can celebrate Olivier and everything else, but this one I, I'm giving a short, a, a short moment because he took it too seriously. And this is kind of like a lot of beginning actors where you want to make it all about you and your point of view. And then you have Pratt Falls and he couldn't make the two work together, bless his heart. Um, so we have other really officious ones, including this at the National Theater Live with Tamsin Greig playing Malvolia. And I really welcome you to watch that and see what they did with gender in that. I, I wanna mention one other thing before we go away from Malvolio. Oh, you're which, good. Yeah, which is, um, Anthony Cher doing this um, 1987 production where he, it became the tragedy of Malvolio where he really realistically descended into madness as it went on and they played his torture scene absolutely like torture. At a time when people are taking bullying so seriously, that makes this part of the play tricky to pull off. And I'm interested to see what we're going to do with, with the production this summer. But you have the potential for almost tragedy. And in fact, Tim Crouch has written this play about bullying called I, Malvolio, where he comes on, talks about his experience during the story. And he actually is, and this is Tim Crouch up here, appears with a noose around his neck he repeatedly says to the audience, do you think this is funny? So Malvolio's line at the end of this play, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you, can often encompass the audience as well. And that makes you wonder, well, with all of this darkness and, and problematic things, how can you have a, a happily ever after at the end when people might not be paired off the right way, when people have been hurt, when people have been abandoned, it's it's an interesting problem. But I, um, and by the way, I love my Gosling's comics with Shakespeare. She often does three pen and old Shakespeare. I think she sums this up well. Well, we've had a great time with all the mistaken identities and general questioning of sexualities, but we're all in happy heterosexual pairs now. So let's wrap this up. How about a song, Festy? So you get this idea of pulling everything together. And, um, and keep in mind, these are absolutely comedic things as well. So um, let me do one more slide, then we can go to the okay. production and come back at the You're end good. for a couple slides time. at the very end. You're good. Okay. I was just laughing at the um, at the hilarity of that information. And then with... Um, just that idea that it's like at the end of it, you're like, okay, great. Well, now we're all in that 
nice little bows that won't get in Shakespeare's time that won't get any of us um put in jail or up until the 80s that won't get any of us put in jail can we just move on now and act like that didn't happen don't think too hard about it uh and that that I love that um that sum up I think that's perfect absolutely so but like I said it does have absolutely hilarious comedic moments including um Fabian Sir Toby and Andrew hiding while Malvolio is reading this letter and they're hiding places that's again one of the moments that I look forward to in every single production um it makes me happy um so with all of these potential pitfalls, I like to see these as opportunities where it makes the production team really think about what is going on in the background on all of this. And so you have to put in the work, figure out how to make it work, and that will almost always make it into a stronger production. So I love Problem Plays because people really have to think about what they're doing. So you have that balance between comedy and then the bullying and Antonio's loss. You have plenty of gender confusion and what you want to say about that. And if you ignore it in this day and age, that's a statement as well. How, how believable are the disguises? Would anyone really think that Cesario is a guy? Um, the casting and so this could be how much the twins look alike this could be um the ages of the character are you going to have a really old sir andrew are you going to have a really old festy and what that does to the balance of the rest of the play the choice of time and place setting if, if this is disco new york and studio 54 that is very different than edwardian countryside from importance of being earnest and all of that informs so much of the play including attitudes toward gender that you have to really think through carefully with this what music choices you're going to make with it are you going to have additional music what music settings and then what you're going to do to make the characters of orsino and sir toby which have become more problematic work so I think what I'm going to do is stop there so that we can talk with the with the cast and, and creatives and then maybe at the end come back and I can talk to you a little bit about where if you want to watch a version or two or find out more about it um, between now and when the play opens, how to do that. Sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. So um, for our little poll in there, I'm going to I'll end the poll um, and then we'll and we'll, we'll get we did have the a, rest we have of the five trivia questions. questions there. Huh? We'll what finish the rest of the trivia questions there. I realize we have a few trivia questions left. So I put that in there too early. I'm sorry, guys, but I'll take a screenshot of it because we did have five separate, we did have five answers. So I will um, steal that and hold on to it. I'm going to hit end polling, but I might restart it here in a little while just so that um, we can get back to that. And I do have the answers of the people who answered. So cool. Um, all right, Allison, if you would like to turn on your camera. So joining us now um, directly from the rehearsal hall, I might point out, is our director uh, for Twelfth Night, Allison Cry. Um, Allison is, uh, as we said earlier, in rehearsal today for Twelfth Night. Um, and so she's joining us uh, live from our rehearsal hall. So welcome, Allison. Thank you so much for coming to hang out with us. Thanks. We're in the middle of rehearsing a fight scene at the moment. Oh, can we see? Just Absolutely. For a second. Yeah, let me if I can figure it out to switch my camera around. All right. So, um, if I am correct, the people that you are currently seeing are uh, Joe Casterline, who is playing Sir Toby Belch, and yes. Ashley Freetag, um, lording in the background there, who's playing uh, our uh, sorry, uh, Andrew Aguicheek. <laughs> Um, yes. So I will let them. Uh, I'll let them talk. I don't know if you guys want to see just for a second what kind of happens in rehearsal. Okay. My movement is very free and clear of any images of things that are in the air. You'll be fine with the other one. I assure you. Therefore, you hold your life to Christ. You take it for God. 
For your opposite hath it been what you strength, skill, and wrath, and furnish man with all. All right, so it looks like the video is frozen up just a little bit. It's kind of hard. There's just not great circus. Um, Allison, if you would like, why don't you um, uh, stow away out of the um, rehearsal hall and we'll finish and we'll uh, talk to you just a bit about the show that you've got going on that we have going on together okay. that I am absolutely a part of. Um, but there, what you saw for just a little bit was Rain Palmer playing Viola. Um, and the scene yes. they were about to rehearse, if I'm not incorrect, uh, Allison, was the fight scene between Viola and Sir Andrew Aguicheek, which goes uh, so incredibly wrong in the funniest way possible, right? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So this is our first, this is our first rehearsal. Um, sorry, I gotta take my glasses off. These are my far away glasses. Um, so this is our first rehearsal with our weaponry. So they're working out the, the swords. We have very long swords. Um, so we're kind of figuring that out. Um, of course, Joe is a pro with his sword work. So he's having a big time with it. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you're being sarcastic or not. I can't tell. <laughs> no, no, Joe is very good. He's very good with his, with his swordsmanship. So he's having a big time. Um, we are in just a minute. David is going to run on as Antonio and break up the fight. Wonderful. Um, so our actor playing David Fry playing Antonio. Um, yes. uh, and our Viola is um, Rain Palmer. And then yes. also in that scene is the is uh, Andrew Akichik, correct? Our Ashley Freetag. Yes. So one yep. of the things and that I'm Hay oh, sorry. And then Hayden Hall. Hayden's yep. Playing Fabian. Uh, playing Fabian, yeah. well, Bestie of Fabian. So um, uh, I I don't have to, I can tell them this, but I think you can can, can talk about it just as much. Um, why don't you mm -hmm. tell us, Allison, about um, the way that we, um, about this production a little bit, you know, the, the interesting things about this production, what makes it a little bit different. Um, there's several things I can think of, but I would love to hear it from the director. Um, Twelfth Night um, is one of Shakespeare's more entertaining comedies, I think, um, because Viola and Sebastian, the, the, the whole concept of it is that these two look so much alike that they are mistaken for each other, this brother and sister. Um, for our particular production, it's going to be mainly because they are wearing the same clothes um, because they are very, very different in physical height. I think William has a good foot and a half on rain, but he does. Um, it's all about suspension of disbelief. So, but it's a it's a comedy about mistaken identities. Um, it's a it has some sweet moments because two of our characters think that they have lost everything, um, that they've lost all of their family and everything in the world. And by the end of the play, not as a spoiler, but by the end of the play, they find out that they haven't really lost what they thought they did and they have gained so very much more. Yeah, the cool so thing about Shakesology is that, you know, we, we just spend two and a half hours completely spoiling the play. Um, so oh, don't yeah. be afraid to, to spoil things, it's okay. The, the script's been around for a minute, um, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know if there's any big reveals we want to hide, but um, I don't, I can't think of any. So if I start on one, just oh. stop me. Uh, but some of the things that make this production in particular a little bit different is that this is a COVID inspired production. You know, we, we didn't um, originally, the plan for these shows was to do the Tempest and Taming of the Shrew. And yes. that cast was intentionally incredibly heavy female, uh, was incredibly heavy of female actors. Yeah. And so um, we ended up casting from the same people that we had originally offered roles to in the 2020 season, which was canceled and changed and reinvented due to the pandemic. Um, so these actors mm -hmm. were all originally cast in Taming of the Shrew, and then we offered them and, and reworked the roles to do um, Twelfth Night. So as a result, we have a very female heavy Twelfth Night. Um, it is yes. a bit of a, of a, it is a commentary on gender in that one of the things that Tennessee Stage Company does a lot of yeah. is we cast actors to play these roles rather than actors to play gender. Um, so I think it's really interesting that we, um, it's not an obfuscation, more of a, 
does the relationship change because of the um, gender of the actor that you're using? So uh, Fabian and Festy, uh, one of the ways that we combated something Jennifer Horn, Dr. Horn talked about was that, you know, um, Festy and Fabian, or is that Festy's role uh, can tend to get cut down the fool's role. So actually mm -hmm. Fabian and Festy are the same actors. We've turned that into one role. Um, that is played by Hayden Hall, who, if you saw our Much Ado About Nothing last year, she played, she was in our six actor Much Ado About Nothing. Um, Orsino and Malvolio are played by the same actor, which is something that is brand new. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, um, that's a male actor, um, Caleb Burnham. Uh, other females, a Andrew Agucheek is played by uh, an actor, uh, Ashley Freetag. Mm -hmm. Who else is who else is a female playing a role that is traditionally played by men or male actors? Um, oh, that might be it. Maybe because we've cut it down so much. Yeah, we've removed so it. many well, people. And put, yeah, and well, and you know, Hayden's playing three roles basically. So a lot of these, a lot of our actors are playing multiple roles in this. Um, yeah. So how many actors total do we have in this production? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eleven. Eleven. Yeah, <laughs> you're one of I, them. <laughs> I cheated. I am one of them. I am one of them. It's true. Um, for sure. It's true. So we. Um, so that's things that kind of set this apart a little bit. We do have a very like female heavy, um, cast. Um, our Sebastian and our Viola, because of the way that it, uh, shook out. Um, Viola is about, so Viola slash Cesario is about, um, five, five. She's going to later be like, I'm five, six, um, no, no. about my height, a little taller than me. I'm five, three. Uh, and then our Sebastian is, um, about six foot. So they don't look the same, right? I think that that's something that, you know, I, we aren't as a pr production. I don't feel like we're trying to hide that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. right. So I think we, we are trying to, or um, instead what, what, what areas of the show do you feel like um, we focus on the most or what are the most important parts to you as the director? Hmm. Well, one of the, one of the characters that, that I really wanted to focus on is Antonio. Antonio is often um, portrayed in a comic light. Um, he's kind of a source of derision. They tend to make fun of Antonio. Yeah. Um, I feel that Antonio really is the only character in this play that shows true nobility. Um, he jumps in and puts himself in harm's way. He knows that Count Orsino will kill him if he finds him, but he stays the course to try and rescue Sebastian and help Sebastian. Um, yeah, and so I just, one of the things that we talked about was in past productions um, uh, across the world of how uh, the relationship between Antonio and Sebastian is sometimes a little weird, right? It's this yeah. character that's like a man who's in love with a young boy or a young man. Um, and I think that one of the wonderful things you've done as a director is take it more as a father-son relationship that I have, yeah. I am taking care of and, and capturing and focusing on um, this young man. And then when he disappears and all of a sudden he finds him again, but he's acting weird. Um, yeah. You know, it really breaks Antonio's heart. Yes, uh, it does. And I love that. I think David Fry, our actor, it just this is his first year on the square, um, or first year doing summer Shakespeare with us, um, is really doing a wonderful job of um, of that. And I, I'm I'm really excited about it. Um, do you yeah. want to talk a little bit about the um, another any other relationships that you might find interesting or um, that you might um, have wanted to highlight? I find that I, I like the I think the relationship that Mariah and Toby has is interesting because technically Toby's a knight um, and so he would be above Mariah but he doesn't ever treat her that way um, he actually really admires Mariah and he admires her wit and how smart she is and you see that in different lines in the play um, I also like the relationship between Olivia and Mariah Again, Mariah is, you know, a serving woman, but Olivia doesn't treat her as a servant. Um, Mariah is very much a confidant and a friend to Olivia. And so Mariah, is a, she's an interesting servant character. Shakespeare writes a lot of servants who are rather wise, um, but you don't see as many female servants who are very wise, whereas with Mariah, you do in this play. 
Um, Emma Wright is playing Mariah and she is doing a fabulous job. We had an excellent rehearsal last night. Um, she's doing a great job with Mariah. Um, if you'd like, I can see if, in, if any of the actors want to say hello. Yeah, I would love that. They need to come right up to the camera so we can hear them. But yeah, um, please feel okay. free to call out literally anyone. <laughs> let me see. Pick on, who see. do you want to pick on? Oh, uh, let me uh, see. So while Allison's doing that, I'll talk a little bit about what the show looks like. So this show we're doing, uh, we're doing in Elizabethan dress. Um, so we are not doing a, the last time we did the show uh, several years ago, we did um, a production in like we we're on a beach and this is definitely an Elizabethan dress. Um, and as far as music is concerned, because of the truncated cast, um, we are not using as much music in the show as a lot of other productions have done in the past. Um, but we are, as always with our shows outdoors, using the cast to play different music um, to let everyone know the show is starting and that intermission is starting back. Um, so come join and check us out for that. Um, so just to uh, name off who I see uh, from left to right, I've got Joe Casterline uh, playing Toby Belch, Ashley Freetag playing Andrew Aguecheek, uh, Helena Jordan playing um, a bunch of characters. Um, <laughs> she's our one of our summer interns. We love her very much. Uh, David Fry playing Antonio. And Will Waring, our other summer intern, who is also playing lots of other characters. Uh, then I think that is Rain Palmer next up, I'm going to guess. Uh, there's Rain yes. playing our Viola and Hayden Hall um, playing Fabian Festi. <laughs> Uh, and then Caleb playing uh, Orsino and Malvolio. So can I pick on Caleb for just a second? Sure. Um, Caleb. <laughs> so um, one of the reasons, when one of the inspirations of having you play two of these roles was when we did our, direct, our production of Much Ado About Nothing, which you might recognize for those of you who saw it, several of the actors on stage that were in that production, you playing so many characters back to back to back um, and being our uh, perfect fall, slapstick guy, um, but also being the, the handsome one, right? One of our, one of our handsome guys to play the heartthrob. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about what it's like to play these two characters that I, I'm going to guess nobody ever doubles up. I feel like this doesn't happen. <laughs> I mean, well, it's very interesting because they're two vastly different characters. You know, Orsino is a duke who is, uh, you know, very love struck and kind of, uh, you know, a, a more loose individual while, you know, Malfolio is a, is a servant who is also very religious. Puritan is what he is described as. So he is very strict and by the book. So, um, but, you know, kind of by the end of the show, their positions kind of flip flop a little bit. Um, and as, but, it, but it's very interesting. It's like two completely different characters and uh, to switch back and forth between them is a lot of fun, but it's also a little difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then can I pick on um, uh, Rain next? We we'll fun, Rain. Rain! Oh, did she leave? I was like, pick her back. Nope, she's right um, here. So oh, wait, Rain, let me get, um, I'm so sorry. You. So Rain is playing our Viola slash Cesario. Um, Rain, will you take a second to talk about, um, uh, I know that when we talked to you about doing this show, the thing that you said to me was that this is your favorite Shakespeare show ever. Is that correct? Am I, am I remembering that right? No, you're remembering it right. So um, when I when I was a very nerdy child and got my hand on all of the abridged classics I could because I couldn't actually read Shakespeare as a five year old, this was the first one that I read and I understood and I started to understand why Shakespeare is interesting. Seeing the characters that he got to play with, seeing a character like Viola, who for a tomboy like I was growing up, it was very lovely to get to see a woman who is like not just playing a stereotypically female role. She's also, you know, of course, Cesario the page and she gets to go forth. She gets to really kind of prove herself and fight for what she loves, even if it does mean hurting herself uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a lot of you might recognize Rain. She's been um, doing shows with us for quite some time, but you also might not because Rain has cut off all of her hair. Um, so Rain, will you wanna, do you wanna talk about your, um, presentation in regards to Cesario or Viola and how that um, that gender plays into you creating and constructing these char characters? So he asked everyone, I just threw that question at her. She's had zero time to prepare. <laughs> Perfection. Um, so 
it's really kind of interesting because while I do have the costume to kind of change because I start off and I'm in a like long skirt and very stereotypically feminine and I change into pants and the more masculine attire, but it's really kind of how you want to hold yourself and move. I honestly don't get to be female Viola very often in this show. I'm like at the very beginning, I get one scene and then a couple of silent moments at the end, but it's very much how you want to hold yourself. Um, I also got to Much Ado last year, and I played Beatrice, but I also played Don John and Virgis. So there's this kind of inherent thought when you're playing different gendered characters about how you want to change the way you walk, the way you hold your shoulders. Uh, Viola very much does not want to be found out. So I'm trying to play with things like, what is a stance that a man would stereotypically have of her kind of stature in society, which would be very kind of informal. You wouldn't actually have a woman walking around with her shoulders very stiff and her hands behind her back. But it's also kind of the way I'm holding my feet. I could stand in a very feminine way, which is a little looser and lighter, but I'm trying to show this masculinity that Viola doesn't actually have so that she can be Cesario. Right. And I have to say, um, as playing opposite you, uh, Olivia, I think one of the things that is the most striking that um, I take away from the character is this understanding that Olivia falls in love with this human that is a person and doesn't know why because no one else has ever made her fall in love. You know, Olivia has a very direct line that's like, now I catch the plague, really? I don't have time for this. Um, and falling in love with just this person um, that is uh, who they are. And I think that, that is, um, that's very important to me as a person. Uh, and so it's wonderful to play uh, opposite you in that role and us, um, playing off of each other in that way. And I, I'm very lucky to share the stage with you. So thank you for that opportunity. I'm very lucky. I like that we get to play with the humanity of the characters because they are just two people meeting. Viola gets to be a little less censored as Cesario because of course, during that time, men could probably speak a little more freely than women, even if they were servants. But at the same time, when we're talking with each other, it's very much, Viola isn't pretending to be Cesario talking where Viola is a person talking to this other person who's gone through a similar loss and uh, it, it's a very honest, our scenes are very honest and I like it. Yes, and that's a very good point. So one of the things that um, that Jennifer, that Dr. Horn touched on, um, but we haven't gotten to talk about yet is that, so Olivia's has just lost her brother and her father in a very short time frame. And as far as Viola is concerned, everything she's ever touched, known, had, family is gone. So these two people, are meeting at this same sort of moment in their lives of grief. Um, and I'm allowed to show it and you aren't, right? So I think that that, that, that is a very um, interesting moment in this show. And, uh, and um, Allison, I would love to, if you wanna turn your camera back around, I'd love to talk to you about what grief means in this show, if you'd like to give us a second for that. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Um. And wow, Dr. Horn, grief. feel free to turn your uh, camera back on and, and ask us questions or ask Jennifer questions. Um, let us know what you, you know, ask us questions, let us know. Go ahead. Um, so yeah, this play is, it, it has a lot to do with grief. It's kind of focused on it. Um, Sebastian and Viola both think that they have lost all the family that they had and they're alone um, in the world. Um, Olivia, like you said, has lost her father and her brother, so she's alone in the world. But Olivia's situation is a little different because Olivia is wealthy and titled, so she is able to still sort of command her own destiny. She can hold off getting married for a while. Um, yeah. whereas Viola would not have as much choice. Um, Viola would probably really be forced into an early marriage um, and it wouldn't really matter if it was a marriage she particularly wanted or not it would be whatever was available um, but yeah grief is a is drives most of these characters um, Antonio you see a little bit of grief in Antonio when Sebastian um, turns on him well he thinks Sebastian turns on him he doesn't really um right. but it's it's a complicated it, it's a complicated play and and that's one of the reasons i like this comedy because it does bring in some dark moments um yeah. i'm curious about malvolio too 
Um, I wonder why Malvolio is the way he is. How did he become such a Puritan? Um, I, I sort of think about that sometimes. Was was Malvolio, you know, was he wild when he was younger and things went badly? And that's why he's such a Puritan now and doesn't yeah. like anybody else to have any fun. Right. I don't know. Um, yeah, but it's and something so- to think about. I would like to talk about a moment that happened in rehearsal um, the other night. So at the end of the play, one of the things that Dr. Horn was just talking about was the um, interestingness and the difficulty of the end of the show. You know, do, is, mm. is it a happy ending? Is this the comedy that doesn't have a happy ending? Um, do you find the happy ending and where do you find it? And I think when we first started rehearsing the final scene, the line, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you, we started with this moment where like, we're all laughing, you know, like this maniacal mm-hmm. crazy guy is laughing and we're like, ha, 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 ha. Is he gonna mm-hmm. kill all of us now or in our sleep or later or what? Um, mm. And then I think it was crazy because we kind of moved on to this, um, having a moment of just silence of when he leaves the stage and I and Tom and you said to me, you know, I, I think your line, um, he has been mightily abused is is sad you know Mm -hmm. and I as an actor being like okay so that's not this isn't like ha 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 you guys got him (laughs) but sitting down at the end and and having this moment of like my friend my the man who a a man who I have spent a lot of my childhood with my whole you know (laughs) life looking up to and following I have to watch him you know and see him be abused and deal mm-hmm. with that, you know, and know that I'm partly to blame for it, even though I push all the blame off on other people, you know, like I let them in the house, you know, I let them mess with him. How do I feel oh. about that? Um, yeah. so I thought that that was really interesting. And that's definitely a moment where we've embraced some of the darkness, I think, um, oh. of the show. Yeah, we have, um, the torture scene, Malvolio's torture scene, um, that can get really dark in some productions we haven't we haven't really gone dark with it um in this production a little bit a little bit but not not as dark as it can be it can be a very disturbing scene um it's it somewhat takes on bullying because Malvolio bullies all the other servants um and so he in turn gets bullied by um Andrew and Sir Toby um, who are above him station wise um, so it, it has its dark moments that, that's for sure I, I think at the end we do for the most part have a happy ending although one thing that that I find interesting at the end of the show is uh, Count Orsino never actually asks Viola to marry him he just assumes she's going to yeah. he doesn't ever actually ask her which uh, kind of mm. but it says, let me see thee in thy woman's weeds uh-huh yeah let's your... see what you look like as a girl and for, for the much. record though he was a duke or count depending on what part of the play you're looking at and so he has lots of power she has no power so of course he's going to assume this however it reads slightly different in 2021 than it would have in 1602 yeah Agreed. i think we i think you know it's funny as a um, we do this with the new play festival as well, you know, uh, as a theater company, you have to grapple with the, um, with where the current show that you are watching and the current lines that yep. you're saying and, um, the current situations that you're putting together and what they look like to the audience around you. Um, yep. and like one of the things that Jen, Dr. Horn had said was, I keep calling, I, I can call you Jennifer. I know I can, okay. I know, I know. But one of the things that, uh, that Jennifer had said was that it becomes a commentary if you don't say anything. Um, and yeah. so I think that that is, um, that that makes it hard, like as a theater company, it makes it difficult to say something about everything when really what you want to do is focus on these one or two things. We want to focus on the, you know, whatever you want to focus on the grief, you want to focus on the darkness, you want to focus on the comedy, you want to focus on the, you mm-hmm. know, you want to focus on the relationships. And I just don't think that any production can make a comment on every single aspect of a show. And you have to be smart about which ones you pick. Um, so well, I, I hope can that's I, what we want. Can I jump in and say one thing? 
and looking at colorblind casting for for so many productions and there's been a huge uptick in violin sebastian being played by people of color but one of the the only part that you never see someone um someone of color playing is malvolio because with the bullying with the treatment that brings in too many different issues that the productions don't want to deal with uh, if you want to deal with that there are other plays for that yeah but well, do you think I mean, that that's interesting and i welcome i mean any theater company who's coming and hanging out and watching this i welcome that because i think that i mean I, I welcome the discussion of the people who would choose to do that and who would want to do right. that and who would want to make the comment and that it be a theater um and a production or at least a production team um centered around um bipoc um members and bribe crew members because i think that that is incredibly important um that you have the right voices in the room to have the conversation as to when it's acceptable and when it's not acceptable um and us being uh not having that that at the moment trying very hard to reach out so if you are a member of the bipoc community and you want to direct a show and you want to act you want to produce please contact us we absolutely want to have you um we, we want to um pull in as many people as we can you know us don't knowing that we aren't gonna do that you know we want to focus on the things that um questions we can tackle um and so i think that that's cool so allison this is your first production directing um shakespeare on the square off the square do you want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what it's like to go from stage managing to directing and what that uh has felt like for you this time um it, it's real weird not having to be here every night i'll tell you that um <laughs> don't say that uh, i'll make you come <laughs> oh god um it's I, I really enjoy directing. Um, I, I've kind of come rather late to it, um, but I really do enjoy it. I've always enjoyed watching the words on the page become living, breathing characters. Um, and so I, I am having a bit of a, a bit of a problem. A lot of the time when the actors call line, Kate and I are both yelling out their line at the same time. Our, director, like, oh, sorry, our stage Kate. manager, uh, Kate, <laughs> Kate Muck, who is brand new to us this year, um, has two She's former great. stage managers for directors. The director for The Tempest is Jennifer Aldridge, who stage managed for us for many years. So she's behind the table with two former stage managers, uh, and she's doing a great job. <laughs> yep, she's doing a fabulous job. Um, I really, directing is different. It is very, very different from stage managing. A lot of what I spend my time on is talking with the actors about why a character acts a certain way. Why, how does this character feel about the situation? How does this character feel about how they've been treated by another character? Um, I spend, I don't necessarily build up much of a backstory. That, that's up to each individual actor. You can have backstory or not. That's up to, to each actor. Some actors like it, some actors don't. Um, but I do want them to really think about the whole world of that character and not just the little slice that we're seeing. So we spend a lot of time on that about, yeah. you know, what do you think? What do you feel? So um, Sometimes it does feel like therapy. Yeah, it does. What do you think it's, about that? It's cathartic. Um, it it can be cathartic. It can also be incredibly frustrating um yes. uh, acting can be the the most fun you'll ever have or the most frustrated you'll ever be um oh, and it can happen all at the same exact time at the same exact moment um oh, yeah. dr horn do you have any questions about the current production or um for for allison before we let her um move on with her with her day honestly i think that you've answered most of mine because i i am so excited and it's so good to see like a little bit of i was saying earlier that sword fighting scene is one of my favorite scenes and i always look forward to seeing what you guys are going to do with with that and with malvolio's layer so i guess i will ask um what we have to look forward to with people hiding and listening to malvolio with the letter oh my goodness we rehearsed that last night um there is a lot of tomfoolery on that um and of course the convention is that <laughs> malvolio doesn't hear anything that's going on behind him he doesn't hear any of it he doesn't see any of it so suspension of disbelief people that's the first tenet of theater 
So it's it's going very well. They they spend part of their time on on stage. They scurry off the wings from time to time. Um, there's some crawling. I believe there's some rolling about on the stage. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Allison, for tuning in with us and and hanging out for just a little bit. We'll let you get back to work. Um, I know you've got a lot to Thanks. do. This is the first book of weekend of being off book. Um, and I, I didn't have to go to rehearsal today. So here's to hoping I got my stuff together for Monday, um, uh, Tuesday, I, think, yeah. is, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm sure I will. It'll be great. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, Allison. Uh, and we'll let Dr. Horn get back to, um, the, the end of her presentation here. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. All right, cool. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. And if you want to get the data together for that next question, we're going to answer it very soon. Okay, great. So let's see, share screen, there we go. Okay, so we're going back to our current slide. There we go. So from this point onwards, I wanna talk about the filmed version. So things that you can actually see for yourself if you are interested and, and want to learn more. Um, I wanted to quickly mention the version that's included in the silent Shakespeare. This is a silent film from I think 1911, somewhere between 1910 and 1912. It is about 12 minutes long and one of the things I love about it is it starts after the shipwreck with people actually coming in on the beach from the water. So seeing Viola coming up on the shore really does make an impact. And it's fascinating to see that so early on in the filmmaking history. Um, and I wanted to include a few versions. I absolutely love the Trevor Nunn film version from 1996 that has Helena Bonham Carter and, and Ben Kingsley among others that is absolutely brilliant. I also wanted to include a couple of TV productions before Kenneth Branagh became a feature film director. He had directed stage productions and he directed this TV version um, that is worth bringing up. So um, especially for Richard Breyer's smile at the end, in a minute you're going to, um, I've, I've got a gif on a future slide of him smiling and is the most painful thing in existence. It makes me happy. And also this version from, from 1970 that was also televised um, has Joan Plowright um, at the time Laurence Olivier's wife. Um, so more Olivier connections with that, but it's the one that has Alec Guinness as, um, as, um, sorry, my, my brain just went, um, Obi-Wan Kenobi himself as Malvolio, and it is the single best thing ever. Um, but I wanted to mention these, these projects in the center that I couldn't get images for, and that is the very first ever televised Shakespeare was Twelfth Night in 1937. So first for Shakespeare in the Park, first in, on TV, and, um, you have these two undeveloped versions of Twelfth Night by some with attached to two of the greatest Shakespeare on film directors, Max Reinhardt, who did Midsummer Night's Dream that next year, um, was going to do it at Warner Brothers starring Marion Davies, who is now most famous for connections with Citizen Kane. You had Amanda Seyfried playing her to an Oscar nomination in Mank this year, um, but brilliant comedian from the Marx Brothers movies. I think she would have been such an excellent choice. So I hate that we never got to see the Marion Davies um, version, but even more more exciting to me is this 1955 project with Joseph Mankiewicz, who did Julius Caesar, with Audrey Hepburn as Viola. I think that could have been absolutely amazing. So those are my two er moments. But now to the very last thing on the screen, which we have to talk about. It is, of course, the one that is in the quiz, a 1957 American TV production, Twelfth Night. And this did air, to be clear. This did air, featured which of the following additions to Shakespeare's play? So we have no one saying 
just Sir Toby and Sir Andrew are pushed around wheelchairs. We have one person saying Olivia has a pet that is a human with a unicorn's head. Evidently, she is a three-year-old girl. Um, Sir Andrew and Cesario faint and are revived with a monkey with spelling salts. No one going for that. But we have one person saying all of the above. And, and we had five people the first oh, time we ran it all saying all of the above. So I think the winning idea here is all of the above. Yeah. And the key here on the screen is this is pitched as Festy's dream. So in a dream, anything can happen. But um, to my knowledge and to knowledge out there, there is no recorded copy of this. There is just the script that's held at the New York Public Library. But I think on behalf of us all, we want that to be found on a cupboard somewhere. So um, going from that to the recent filmed versions, and as I said before, there were th the three main Shakespeare related theaters in England, um, the National Theater, the RSC and the Globe, all put on productions in 2017 that were then filmed and shown in theaters. Um, all of these are available in different places. They can be slightly difficult to find, but if you're interested- So the answer was all of the above? I'm so sorry. Oh, yes. The answer okay, cool. was- The answer is all of the above. So yay. Good job, everybody. Oh yeah. So you didn't want just one of those. You definitely wanted all of them, including the human with the unicorn head. Um, so all of these versions on your screen can be found somewhere. If you're having trouble finding one and you're curious, feel free to send me an email. Um, so those are, are these two on the side. And this one, you also in 2018 had a live film, British independent film, um, with Sheila Team, um, who had been in the all-female Don Mar Shakespeare, um, now playing Viola and, and really interesting version. You also have a one, only one out of five um, from, or out of six from North America. And that is Jess Mackina, full on musical version of Twelfth Night from Stratford, Ontario. Um, and then this version that was originally at the Globe that was originally at Mill Temple Hall and then they brought back in 2013. It is amazing. I highly recommend it. Um, you then also have film adaptations. And so, well, I now that we have some options on your screen, what um what Oscar winning film ends with Viola's shipwreck from Twelfth Night? I'm sure you couldn't possibly guess which one of those would end with Viola's shipwreck from Twelfth Night or which one of these movies won an Oscar. Anyone guessing she's the man? Totally. Okay. I'm not allowed to guess because this is actually my favorite Shakespeare movie. Okay. Um well. The one that won the um, won the Oscar was 1999 Shakespeare in Love. Um, yes, it is debatably the most controversial Oscar win ever because it was the same year as Saving Private Ryan. Sorry, um, I like it. But it ends, it, it has him finding his muse with a character named Viola. And when they can't be together, he writes a play where she gets a new start. And, um, and my favorite story about this is um, I happened to go to um, doing my master's with a guy who, who worked on this film as well as on Kenneth Branagh's films. And he showed us some, some other footage of it. And so I swear if I hadn't seen this, I wouldn't think it was real. But they showed us footage after she walks up on the beach. She approaches a couple of Native Americans and says the first her her first line of Twelfth Night, which is, what country, friends, is this? One of the, the Native Americans looks at her and says, this is America. Clearly, this did not make it into the final film. Um, you don't say. I, yeah. So, and of course, now I want someone to find that footage, post it online, and then put go into Donald Glover's song. Um, but... 
slightly different version, uh, but it is an interesting thing for, for the connections with Twelfth Night. And of course, during the course of the play, she dresses as, as a man to become an actor. But I want to explore the, these other things on, on the screen. She's the Man came from the same people who brought you 10 Things I Hate About You, um, a modern adaptation of Taming of the Shrew. Um, I would argue it's not as successful. This this one is, is, it's not my favorite, but I will say it is fun. And you also have a young Channing Tatum as Duke. It did come out the year that, that's why I turned my camera originally. It did come out when I was the target audience for this movie. And I do remember watching it a lot. Um, now it uh, kind of occurs to me that maybe it wasn't because it was a good movie, but because I liked the uh, whole idea of it. But I did, I was the target audience for this movie when it came out. And I know that a lot of my friends and I watched it now, I did go to a performing arts high school. So maybe we were the target audience. Well, <laughs> and I will say so often when I start talking about Twelfth Night, my students would have that sounds like she's the man and suddenly everything works better. So I'm glad that the movie exists it, and, and Malvolio becomes a spider in that one. Um, yeah. So you also have Disney Channel movie um, Motocross where they're not accepting her in the sport. So she finds in. And if you are a fan of um, the mockumentary films of Christopher Guest and, and Rob Reiner, the um, Spinal Taps, the um, Best in Show Waiting for Guthman. Uh, I do want to put what you will on your radar. It is slightly harder to find, unfortunately, but this was shot while an actual production of Twelfth Night was touring around Britain, and it was a um, co- creation of filter theater and the royal shakespeare company and while they were putting on the tour they were filming all of this behind the scenes stuff that that parallels what is going on with their characters and i absolutely love it so um yeah if you if you can't find a copy and you and you need to let me know and, and we'll figure it out um so those are, are all worthy of discussion. As I said before, I've created a couple of YouTube playlists. By the way, this is um, Alec Guinness with the sweet lady, Ho-Ho, with the kicking, uh, the Ho-Ho, and Richard Breyer's absolutely terrifying smile with Malvolio at, that makes my life. And both lists also um, have this amazing clip of Judy Dench with Benedict Cumberbatch as, as Orsino that they filmed at the Hay Festival where she is still word perfect as Viola from the first time she performed it in 1969. It's brilliant. And um, I will throw the, the link to that. Um, I put it up on the Tennessee Stage Company's YouTube. Um, so you can find it, uh, find this wonderfully extensive list there. And I'll put that in the chat. And to be clear, I figured um, I made two lists. One, if you just want to get straight to the good stuff. And the second one is everything in the kitchen sink, including a Lincoln Center production from 1997 with Paul Rudd as Orsino in a show that has an onstage pool where he derobes and gets in. And I think I remember woos from the audience because people are cultured in Shakespeare. Um, it also had Helen Hunt as, as Viola, Kira Sedgwick as, as a really strong Olivia, and the, the dad from ALF as either Toby Belch or Sir Andrew, because why not? And he's really good at Shakespeare. Who would have thought? Um, so just know there are two different versions. That one also has like a full Twelfth Night ballet. Well, I will say so when I had to create it, it actually kind of just made me create one. So there, so what yeah. I, what you're gonna get from the Tennessee Stage Company is actually just the whole nine yards. Okay. That's um, okay. But I'll post, but I'll we will post put the, the links for to both on, in the chat here. Yes, I will. <laughs> So um, one final note, because we, as, as you've heard from me and from Allison and from Caitlin, um, Malvolio has that great line, I will be revenged on the whole pack of you. So to quote from the final song of the play, what's to come is still unsure and be, be waiting for part two, Malvolio's revenge. So thank you guys so much for showing up today. And if anyone has any questions, I'm, I'm, we, we have a little bit of time left over. So I'm happy to answer any questions it, that you may have. And Caitlin can answer any questions you have about the production. 
Yeah, absolutely. So if anyone's got any questions about um, acting in the production, um, working as a producer on the production, um, I can absolutely help with those, uh, answer those things. And while we're looking around to see if anyone wants to throw in any questions, um, I'll take a second to talk about uh, what we've got coming up next. So um, our next Shakesology will be covering The Tempest. So this, this season's um, Outdoor Shakespeare Festival will be doing uh, Twelfth Night and The Tempest. Um, our event for The Tempest will be on June 26th at three o'clock. Two can weeks check, from today. Yeah, two weeks from today. You'll be able to check us out right here um, on Facebook Live or join us on Zoom or on our YouTube channel for those watching us on YouTube. Um, you'll be able to drop down any of your questions or any of your comments or anything that you think is interesting. Um, and feel free to use the chat as a way to um, talk to the other people that are hanging out in the room with you um, and, and participate in that fashion as well. Uh, these events, again, are free. Um, and they are free because we are a 501c3 company and we subsist on your donations. So if you do take the time and you enjoy this kind of work and want us to continue to produce it, um, please take a moment to drop us a donation. Um, our Venmo and our PayPal can be found at Tennessee Stage, uh, and I will drop in the chat a link to, um, to take care of that if you would be interested or able to send us uh, a donation to help us continue on with the work that we do. Um, next for that, so we're, while we're doing all of these um, wonderful um, things, is all to gear up for uh, Shakespeare Off the Square. Um, so our Shakespeare Off the Square this year uh, will be at Imes Nature Center. Um, so please join us there, um, July 8th through August 8th. The tickets are $15 because this is a production outside and we are limiting the seats due to ensure that we are um, meeting all of the COVID regulations required by um, the event venue and by the city. Um, we are have to charge a ticket price. So they are $15. Um, there will be two matinees that are inside. Those will also be at IMES. And you can find all of the ticket information at IMES.org backslash Shakespeare. Um, so if you are interested in getting tickets, please uh, get them now. The tickets have been on sale for just a little while and they are starting to go pretty quickly. So please, if you're interested in coming out this summer, we would absolutely love to have you um, and grab the tickets there. And, and we would love to have that uh, and see you there. So I've put the um, YouTube playlist out in the chat. Please check that out. Um, uh, Dr. Horn did a wonderful job putting it together um, and it is also on the Facebook chat as well. Um, and uh, then I will put our um, donation information in the chat here in just a second. Um, so what, let me ask you a question, Dr. Uh, okay. Horn. When you are preparing for these events and putting these together, what is your favorite place to go look for information? I tend to read a lot of books and um, I, I'm i so interested in the performance history and watching as many versions as I can. And I will say, um, I, I put these over here because I didn't get to talk about them. These are the, um, let's see, the DVDs and, and one VHS copy that I have for Twelfth Night. And all of the recent ones, only one of them was on DVD. So they're also streaming. And if anyone has access to the drama online database, and I know Pellissippi State students and staff do, um, I'm assuming probably UTK people do as well, is absolutely wonderful. And um, four, uh, the three from 2017 are all streaming there, as well as the, um, the globe one that had been in middle temple hall and then and then reprised um so i am a huge fan of that database because it lets you watch so many good versions of it in one place um and yeah i just i get lots and lots of books that that have information about the performance history there's a great cambridge um series that is um shakespeare and performance so yeah, i yeah. Unfortunately, here. I don't have an easy online answer for people to look up. I wish I did, but the, um, the Royal Shakespeare Company has good archives with information about previous um, versions. Public Shakespeare has so many good accessible things for, to learn more about the plays, as does the Globe website. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, just start Googling and those three sites, 
the public, um, certainly the Folger in Washington, D.C. Um, they have an amazing website. Um, the RSC and the Globe are, are all worthwhile places to get started. Yes, I hope that this link will work. But actually, one of the things that I would like to drop um, in the chat is the um, Spotify play or the, the Spotify playlist to the Twelfth Night Public Works cast recording. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a production that um, I don't know if is this was this one part of your this was part of your um, discussion. Okay, so this I, is a no, but I, I will say I know a little bit about it. One of the great things that the Public Theater in New York City. This is the group that gave us the original American Shakespeare in the Park, but they have a public works series that they do um, at the end of the summer, where they have people from all five boroughs participating in what is usually a musical, and so they have different groups come on stage for different parts of it to participate to make sure that people are taking ownership of Shakespeare. This is your play, your production, and um, and they have such great performances with that. Yeah, absolutely. The director, um, Alice, and I both bonded when we were talking about doing this show over this soundtrack. Um, and I, I absolutely love it. So if you uh, want something fun to listen to and you're a big musical nerd, um, check out the the um, album that I just dropped into the chat for these two things. That's that's a personal favorite of mine. Um, and I think my favorite uh, when I'm working on the Tennessee Stage Company preferred uh, copy of the shows or the Arden copies. Um, so if you're ever in McKay's or you're online and you're looking for something that's a good copy of the script that you'd like to have in your home, um, the Arden versions are always really, really uh, wonderful. And that's something that we use. Uh, at at the stage company and have in rehearsal multiple copies of every time. Um, and I will say I have a personal connection with that because my my PhD thesis advisor um, at King's College London was Anne Thompson, who was one of the three general editors for the Arden Three Shakespeare, and she is an amazing woman, and they do good work. Yeah, I I do love that. Um, Norton and Norton um, also has a wonderful anthology of Shakespeare. If you're interested in that. Um, but my other favorite is Cambridge. So my background is uh, actually is an educator. Um, I My degree is in theater and English for teacher licensure because I never wanted to have a lot of money that I ever made in my life. And so I uh, my favorite um, tool for these is actually the Cambridge um, books, which oftentimes include pictures from, there we have, there we go, from, uh, the, from RSC, uh, from the um, Royal Shakespeare Company. Yes, Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and those are probably my favorite um, of the ones because it includes the pictures and asks questions and thought provoking things that teachers use oh. a lot. But as an actor, it helps me to walk and you I, through. I the will show. say, I think that you may be referring not to that one, but there's a Cambridge School Shakespeare. Yes series that does exactly that and now um the globe theater has some of those and i don't have the cambridge school thing but you see how many pictures and the, and cambridge school shakespeare does very similar things yeah and so i really enjoy that and as an actor i think it's a lot of people think it's nuts and then my other main tool which as a director i i talk about and i'm very vocal about is like i will read every side by side i can find of any text i I don't have a doctorate, right? I don't, I didn't start in this. Like my, my concentration was um, actually like, was dance and, um, and singing and movement based things. So I spent a lot of my education teaching actors how to move and use their bodies for their characters was not the language where I started. Um, so uh, even having a degree in English, you know, I'm very aware of the things that I don't know. Um, so I like to read the side-by-sides um, and I will, when I uh, was very fortunate several years ago to direct Hamlet, I came in the first rehearsal and had seven side-by-sides. I had, that's the most I've ever been able to find of any show was seven, not just no fear Shakespeare, but other ones. And some of them are terrible and some of them are very wrong. But the thing that it being wrong teaches you is that, you know, it's wrong. You look at you go no that's not what that means which means as an actor you have now made a decision Yay. <laughs> which is all you have to do <laughs> that's the whole point um so i think that that that's my that's probably my favorite um my favorite things as far as that's concerned for those of you who are interested in learning more about shakespeare um and uh, and learning more about the language in general um or how actors kind of prepare for this kind of stuff 
Um, there are some of them who would never read a side by side because they don't want to be told what other people think. To them, it feels like a line reading. You know, directors are not allowed to say, why don't you say the line like this? Um, and they feel like a side by side is the equivalent of a line reading. Um, and I read it as uh, research. You know, that's that's what's helpful for me. Um, all right, cool. Well, I think that's all of our time for today. Dr. Horn, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, just thanks to everybody for showing up. Cool. Well, and, thank you. And, and also, I will say one other thing. Um, if you haven't been able to tell from everything I said today, I don't believe that there is one version of this play. What I love about all of Shakespeare's plays is that there are so many right interpretations. So I love having seven different side-by-sides because I have seen a lot of productions and that's just the DVDs of this play. And I'm still surprised by new versions that I watch and like, oh, I never thought of that. I love that about Shakespeare. And so I encourage you, don't watch one and say, oh, I've seen it. Um, keep, keep looking for the good ones and keep going with all of them. And I can't wait to see the productions that the Tennessee Stage Company are putting on this year. Uh, yeah, I am super excited about them. I think we've got some really wonderful um, actors coming together to do this and a wonderful production staff. Um, and I am personally very excited to talk about The Tempest in two weeks. Um, I am very fortunate in this year, I get to play Ariel in The Tempest, which is one of the roles as a dancer I have always wanted to play. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have a directors who are uh, definitely very supportive of, of that. So come back on June 29th uh, and hang out with, Jen with Dr. Horn and I, uh, Jennifer and I, as we talk about this. Um, and we'll uh, see you all then. So thanks everybody, have a great day. Record.